Are we live? One thing so. Okay, so you posted on Twitter, right? Are we live? So. Yeah, the, the the YouTube live stream is working. Yeah, copy. YouTube live stream is working here as well. You can I think we should start. Right? Yeah, let's begin. I think the live stream is working, so we're, I think we're ready. All right. Uh, Bala, can you go full screen on this? Or is... Yeah, all right. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, Good evening, everyone who have joined us from across the globe and from India. Uh, we are South Indian SDR user group, uh, SISDR-UG, and this is our fourth event. Uh, so this event is uh, kind of very close to us because this also marks our one-year anniversary. Uh, so we started the SISDR-UG uh, almost uh, more than a year back with the uh, with the idea that, you know, to spread more and more awareness about uh, software-defined radio uh, digital signal processing and related topics here in India, as well as uh, for uh, someone who is also joining us from across the globe. So uh, the mission was to facilitate anyone or everyone who is you know involved in this field of work. Uh, so uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we have a couple of co community announcements. One is the SISDR UG WhatsApp group which is something that we will be beginning, uh, we'll be starting shortly. And, you know, the details would be updated on our website. So this WhatsApp group is something like our Slack workspace, which is already there existing. Uh, so uh, here we'll be posting about our updates. Uh, you know, we will also be connecting uh, the community on the WhatsApp. So if you have any questions on how to get started or maybe uh, something related to uh, software defined radios, you know, uh, this is the place where you can uh, directly get in touch with the community. So this is uh, something upcoming in uh, our community and uh, we'll keep you posted about this uh, very soon. So the details would come up on the website. And second is the GR Con. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the 12th annual uh, GR Con is happening in uh, Washington, DC this time. and uh, uh the dates are 26th to 30th september and you can check out the link uh, which is events.gnuradio.org slash event slash 18 for more de details uh, i think the registrations are also open and the keynote speakers have been announced so uh, you can check out uh, the gr con and i think uh, mr neil uh, would be adding more to uh, it uh, and we'll be sharing more details about gr con uh, at the end of the event So uh, something about the people who make this happen every now and then. So this is the organizing committee. We consist of five people uh, who are passionate and into the uh, into the SDR and uh, want to uh, you know take forward the SDR community. So uh, I would like to uh, introduce everyone, and they can speak for themselves. So we'll go in alphabetic order. So Aditya. Uh, you go first. Hi. Good evening, everyone. 
I'm Mesaditya Arun Kumar. I'm joining in from Bangalore, India. And currently, I was previously working with Briskin for set. My interest lies in software dependent radio implementation for side channels and electronic warfare. Currently, I'm working as an R&D engineer in DL for DSP systems. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, hello, everyone. I forgot to uh, speak out my name in the beginning. So, hi, my name is Apar. Apartusu, and uh, I work with Pia2 as a senior uh, security researcher. Uh, and um, most of my work includes reversing of hardware firmware and performing side channel and fault injection on embedded targets. Also, uh, uh, signal reversing and uh, SDR is something uh, that I love. So, uh, therefore, uh, you know, that therefore. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm working with this community, and uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, Balaji, you next. Thanks, Abba. Uh, myself, Balaji. So, I was working with Brisk Infosec, and uh, my areas and interests are like with embedded reversing, software defense videos, and wireless communication. So, apart from all those things, I have uh, me uh, like interest in about uh, learning about Canvas, uh, which probably uh, I'll be doing my masters. Thanks. Mr. Neil, you're next. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Neil Pandeya. Um, I'm an applications engineer and group manager at National Instruments at this research, and I'm based in Austin, Texas in the United States. Uh, I work a lot with 4G and 5G communications, and of course, with software-defined radio and USRP radios. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Thanks to everybody for joining. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rohan. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, my name is Rohan. I'm currently a senior computer vision engineer at Hyperphonics Devices. I work on uh, surveillance actor surveillance applications, primarily. Uh, my interests are primarily in high performance computing and so and the intersection with uh, signal processing. So happy to be here and looking forward to meeting all of you. Thank you, Rohan. Uh, yeah, so that was our organizing committee. Uh, so now let's begin the event four. Uh, we have a very strong, solid lineup for uh, today's event. So we have uh, in total four talks today uh, on, on various uh, interesting topics. And uh, let's start with our first talk for today. which is introduction to GNU radio part two. So the first part was, uh, I believe in the first, very first event. Uh, and this is the continuation to the GNU radio series by Mr. Neil Pandeya. So uh, Mr. Neil Pandeya is a principal SDR uh, application engineer and SDR group leader at National Instruments in Austin, Texas. His backgrounds and interests are in open source software development, wireless communication, digital signal processing and DSP and signal processing, 4G LTE and 5G NR, cellular networks and software defined radio. So prior to working with NI, he worked at several startups and defense companies such as en Envoy Networks, Range Networks, Draper Laboratory, Texas Instruments and Teradyne. He has previous technical management experience and university teaching experience. He is a co-founder and co-organizer of the uh, New England Workshop for SDR, which is the new SDR, and is co-organizer of the GNU Radio Conference, GRCon. He holds a bachelor degree in electrical engineering uh, from uh, Wolfshire uh, Polytechnic Institute, VPI, and master's degree in electrical engineering from Northeastern University and is a member of IEEE and Eta Kappa Nu. He has an amateur radio license and is aspiring to obtain a private pilot license. So now I would like to welcome Mr. Neil Pandeya to start uh, his session on introduction to GNU Radio part two. So over to you, Mr. Neil. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapar. Um, thank you to everybody uh, for joining the event today. Um, this is part two of the GNU Radio uh, series that we're running. 
uh, the first series, the first um, segment in this series talked about just an introduction to GNU Radio and how to use GNU Radio. And we showed a few example uh, flow graphs, and I think we showed the FM receiver example in particular. Uh, in today's session, we'll talk about how to install GNU Radio. Uh, my focus today will be on the Linux platform, but we'll also talk about Windows and Mac briefly. And then I'll show you the steps needed to install from a binary package and also from source code. I'll start by sharing my screen and taking a look at the GNU Radio website and the wiki. And I'll share my entire screen. I hope it's not too small. I hope the resolution is, uh, well, the, the windows are large enough that you can, you can see everything. Just let me know if it's, if it's too small and I'll, I'll change it. So what I have here is uh, the GNU Radio homepage, which is just gnuradio.org. And there's a lot of resources here. There's, there's news and there's a blog and there's some resources up at the top. Uh, including documentation and, and events and things like that. Um, the GNU Radio uh, project maintains a wiki documentation for GNU Radio. And it includes links to things like how to get started, um, how to install GNU Radio, um, how to communicate with the, with the community. Um, there's a, a chat server called Matrix. I'll talk about that in a minute as part of the installation in case um, it, it can be very useful to have that resource for questions and answers and just connecting with the community overall. Uh, and then there's documentation, including a usage manual, and then a list of blocks, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then there are some tutorials and then some other resources here. So this is a good starting point, a good um, uh, landing page to begin uh, or, or place to search for any, um, any questions or resources you're looking for, including uh, say things like the API, the GNU Radio API, or other events like the Summer of Code program, which is a great way for students to participate through the Google Summer of Code project. Um, there's information about hardware and, and, and other associated programs like GQRX, uh, which are based on GNU Radio. Um, and then from this page, you, you can find the installation page, uh, the top level installation page, which is here. And the three platforms that are supported for GNU Radio are Linux, Windows, and Mac. Um, let me talk about Windows first. Um, I won't focus on Windows, but I will uh, mention that GNU Radio runs on Windows, although historically it was not a focus platform for the GNU Radio environment. And so historically, um, and really probably up until now and including now, Windows is probably the, the least mature platform in terms of installing and running um, GNU Radio. Um, that was changed or addressed over the years by a couple of things. Um, let me go to the page specific for Windows. They have a Windows installer page on the GNU Radio website. And I'll, I'll start from this um, package here from Jeff Nearbor, um, who I believe is a um, who's based in the Washington DC area. And for many years, he maintained uh, a binary installer for Windows and openly uh, distributed that to the public and had a GitHub page that showed exactly how he built the binary installer and, and basically how you could follow his steps um, in building from Visual Studio all of the dependencies for GNU Radio on Windows. And that was a huge, uh, a huge help, a, a wonderful resource. Um, however, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why, I think his uh, website and some of his resources are no longer available. If you click um, uh, and try to go to the link for his page or his domain, it, it, it's not connecting. So I'm not sure what happened. And it seems like it's been uh, uh, unreachable for, for some time, maybe a month, and I think even before then. I think if you Google his name, you can find um, the, the GitHub page that he has where he shows all the the scripts that he uses for building GNU Radio on Windows. These seem to still be available. I don't know if they're actively maintained. Some of these are, um, you know, these commits, these, uh, um, the last update on these folders is quite old. Um, so I'm not sure how actively he's doing this anymore, but this was something that a lot of people used to use and was, was super helpful in building Windows on, uh, sorry, building GNU Radio on Windows. But I think um, in the last couple of years, it's um, or maybe last one year, it's uh, it's stagnated. Uh, I don't think he's maintaining it anymore. There's older versions of Visual Studio that are used, and uh, as you see from here, the 
the last set of updates were you know several years ago. All of these are, are, are several years ago. So even if you look at say the uh, you know some of the commits and, and commit history, um, you can see that that there hasn't been a commit since 2020. So that's about two years ago, June of 2020. So this doesn't unfortunately look like it's maintained anymore. Um, but another tool has come up uh, that really has even further simplified the installation process. Actually, not just for Windows, but really for all the platforms. But it it it's most especially useful probably on Windows, and that's Radio Conda. And this comes from Ryan Voltz um, at MIT Haystack Observatory in the Boston area. So uh, I'll give a special shout out to him uh, for all of his efforts, um, as well as some of his colleagues like uh, John Swoboda and others, who have done a lot of really, really, really useful work and, and helpful work to make this package um, you know, work well and, and keep it maintained. Um, so this package is very, very actively maintained and installs not just GNU Radio, but several other out of tree modules and associated um, you know, packages or libraries, um, such as the digital RF file format, uh, the GQRX um, spectrum visualization program, and these four out of tree modules. So all of this can be um, installed using the Conda package manager and it supports all the different hardware here. So these hardware libraries can be uh, also installed uh, for all these devices. And these are probably most of the devices you would use with GNU Radio. Probably the most popular are the ADLM Pluto boards from Analog Devices, um, Blade RF, uh, the Edis Research USRP devices, um, the Hack RF, and the Lime, Lime SDR boards. The RTL SDR2, of course. Um, uh, really, all of these are quite popular. The RTL is a receive only device, but but the others are, uh, most of the others are transmit and receive. Um, and so hardware support for all of them is enabled by using the, the Radio Conda package. So this is a great way to install these tools on Windows. Um, like I said, Mac and Linux are also supported. So you can certainly use these, use uh, Radio Conda to install on those platforms. But um, in Windows, it's really a big help because there's really no other alternative. Um, building all that from source would take a lot of time um, and uh, having this package available is a huge help. So on Windows, um, I won't be able to show this to you or demonstrate this to you. Um, that won't be the focus of my talk today, and, and my talk's limited to about a half an hour. But if you are on Windows, um, Radio Conda is, is really the best way to install GNU Radio. I will add a cautionary note, again, that Windows is not as well a maintained platform for GNU Radio as Linux and Mac. Um, so if you are using Windows, you may experience other problems or issues that that uh, you may not see on other platforms. In general, I think you would be better served by using Linux or Mac. Um, but GNU Radio certainly does run under Windows. And uh, if, if that's what you'd like to do, then the Radio Conda installer is really the best way to do that. Um, next is Mac. And I'm not showing uh, Mac here today. It's also something I don't focus on. I'm pretty Linux focused. Um, but GNU Radio runs very well on the Mac. And the, the recommended way to install it is through Homebrew. And that should work well. You should be able to install um, the latest version of GNU Radio on any recent version of Mac OS. And, and that should run just fine um, and should be very straightforward to do. Um, if you have any uh, issues or questions with that, um, there's good support in the community. You can, you can uh, uh, post a question on the mailing list. Um, uh, or you can ask uh, me and, and my team here at Edis Research. Uh, we have a Mac expert on the team who can help uh, with that. So if you do have any any problems installing GNU Radio on Mac, just let us know. Um, or, or you can go on the chat system, the chat server, Matrix, or post on the mailing list. Um, I'll talk about getting technical help, technical support at the end of the talk. And I'll, I'll, I'll call out specifically how you can do that. Um, um, and um, yeah, so that's so that's Mac. Uh, and then last but not least is Linux. Let me go back a page up at the top. On Linux, there are a couple of ways to install. Um, you can install from a binary package. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, you would just add the GNU Radio repository and then simply install GNU Radio. And that would give you whichever version of GNU Radio was available for the version of Ubuntu uh, that you're using. Now, here I'm assuming you're using Ubuntu. Certainly you can install this on Fedora. 
and, and other Linux platforms um, as well. Uh, but probably the easiest are Ubuntu and Fedora because there are packages for those. Most of the focus tends to be on Ubuntu, and that's what, what I use and, and a lot of people use by default. And so a lot of the documentation is written uh, for Ubuntu, but Fedora should work as well. There are packages available for Fedora, and um, you can certainly install from source code. Um, now, there are a couple of reasons you might want to install from source code. Um, the message here says generally there's no need. And if you're just using GNU Radio and you're not trying to modify it, modify the code for it, um, you generally don't need to install from, from source code. Um, one reason you may want to install from source code, obviously, is if you do want to develop for GNU Radio itself and, and, and perhaps modify and enhance the GNU Radio uh, source code. But you may also want to do this because you may need other versions that are either not available in, in the package manager, or you just need to have multiple versions installed side by side. And there's a good reason you, uh, you would want to do that, or there's, there's, there's several reasons this may come up. First is if you're using an older version of uh, Linux uh, or Ubuntu, say 2004, which you might say isn't really that old. It's a long-term release. Um, it's only about two years old. But if you're using that or say uh, Ubuntu 20.10 or 21.04, or in any of those releases, there's only one version of GNU Radio that is uh, for which there are packages available for each of those releases, Ubuntu releases. So for example, if you're using Ubuntu 2004 and you install from a package, you will get just one version. You, you, you can't really select between the multiple versions, um, or at least easily from a binary package that I'm aware of. Um, the most straightforward way is to install the one that, that's packaged by default. And if you don't want to use that version for whatever reason, perhaps it's old, perhaps it has a bug that, that is fixed in a later version, uh, or it's lacking a feature or, or something like that, uh, or it's um, a 3.9 release and you, you want to use the newer 3.10 releases, I'll explain more about the releases in a moment, um, then you wouldn't have any, any recourse. You wouldn't have any other way to do that. You'd either have to upgrade to a different Ubuntu version and then um, you know check uh, that that version uses the version of GNU Radio you want for, in its package uh, repositories, or you'd have to build from source. And build from source always gives you that flexibility, and it also allows you to install these versions side by side and, and switch between them. Um, and so um, I would generally recommend building from source, unless you know that you need just one version of GNU Radio and you don't think you'll ever need any other and you're not changing um, your operating system, like upgrading different versions of Ubuntu. Maybe, maybe you can't do that. You're using 2004 and it comes with a certain version of GNU Radio, but that's not the one you're interested in. Um, so I, I generally suggest building from source code, unless you're in a very specific case like that, where the default setup is exactly what you want. And building from source is not very hard. Um, when you install GNU Radio, whether you do so from a binary package or from uh, source code, there are dependencies you'll need to install first. And those will vary <clears throat> based on the version of GNU Radio you're installing, as well as the version of Ubuntu that you're running. Um, each version of Ubuntu, say from going, going from 2004 to 21.10, or you know, they, they, the release is every six months. So there's a 2004 release, a 2010 release, a 2104 release, and a 2110 release. Now there's a 2204 release and so on. And all those releases, um, could have different uh, packages listed as dependencies. Package, name cha package names change over time, and um, new packages are introduced, and, and old packages are deprecated, things like that. So um, the, the list of packages can, can change. And so this might work on Ubuntu 2004, as it says here, but it might not work on a newer or older version of Ubuntu, and you might have to change those names. Furthermore, each version of GNU Radio has slightly different requirements. For example, in 3.9, there are some additional packages that are necessary. And in 3.10, uh, there are yet more packages that, that are necessary. And so you'll, you'll have to install these first. Um, you'll need an active internet connection to do this. Um, it's a little harder and trickier to do offline. It is possible. You can do these downloads on a computer that's connected to the internet and then cache those packages and then bring them over to a system that's that's not connected to the internet, but it certainly is a lot easier to do this while your system is is online. Uh, you can type these commands from a terminal window. 
I won't explain how to use a terminal window or, or anything like that. I'll assume that that you know that um, it's kind of a necessary prerequisite um, knowledge or experience you'll have to have. Um, but I will explain the commands. Uh, I, I'll assume that you have some background in what these commands do overall, but uh, but I, I will explain them. And so the first step in installing GNU Radio is the dependencies. And so we do that by installing packages using this program called apt. And the sudo just means that we run it as root. And so we can go and install um, the following packages that are highlighted here. All, all that list, all those uh, space separated lists, uh, items, names, are names of packages. And so this command will, will simply install those. I can show you that. My system already has these installed, or at least it should. And so it shouldn't actually have to install anything. <clears throat> oh, this may not work because of the, uh, the new lines. Let me, uh... okay. Yeah, so in this case, um, I think most of the things were already installed except it looks like two. So I'll go ahead and install those. And it's finished. Um, the time it takes to install these packages will vary uh, based on your internet connection speed and uh, the speed of your computer and your, and your, and your disk. Um, but generally, it shouldn't take too long. Um, uh, in this case, I installed the dependencies for 3.8. I could go ahead and install for 3.9 or 3.10, but I'll, I'll worry about that later. I'll also stop here for a moment and mention a few things about the versioning for GNU Radio. Uh, let me come back here. This is the GNU Radio um, GitHub page. This was the web page that I showed you earlier, and this is the, the uh, GitHub page for the GNU Radio software. And it has links on the front page just to steer you uh, to the right place to get started. Uh, but let's take a look at one aspect of this and look at the different versions of GNU Radio that, that are there. And you can tell that from the tags. Um, I won't explain how Git or GitHub work. I'll assume you, you know that, but I'll make a mention that in Git, um, there are certain commits uh, that, that, that constitute different versions, and those versions get tagged. And so you can refer to the uh, versions of GNU Radio by their tag names. And so here, for example, most of these probably are self-explanatory, um, like this this one here that I have highlighted, uh, version 3.10.2.0. And most of these uh, softwares, like uh, GNU Radio and, and some others, I'll, I'll maybe show you quickly, um, like GQRX, we, we saw a reference earlier to that. Um, they have these um, four octet version numbers. Um, it's it's like a semantic uh, versioning scheme that that's used. And so three is sort of the, the top level version number that doesn't change very often. In fact, I don't think it's changed in in like 10 years or some really long time. Uh, and then there's a, a major version number, so 10 in this case, and those can change. Um, it, it varies actually quite widely, but um, typically not more than once a year. Uh, and then there's uh, subversions below that. And you can see all the different versions of GNU Radio going back, and it goes back quite far to when the rep repository was created. Um, there are versions before this, but they weren't using Git at that time. So that's that. those older versions are not captured here. Um, but you can go really far back. These versions are obsolete. Um, they're not maintained anymore, even though it says maint, which is usually indicating that uh, a particular uh, tag or branch is maintained. Uh, th those versions are not maintained anymore. Um, and really, these days, there are three primary versions of GNU Radio in use. Uh, for many years, uh, GNU Radio and the community were using 3.7, and the 3.7 releases uh, lived for about six years, I think. It was a long time that we had the 3.7 releases. Um, but those um, ended. Uh, there's no more maintenance available for them, and they're basically deprecated at this point. And after 3.7 was 3.8, uh, and that's uh, still actively used, although it's probably going to be deprecated by the end of the year. Um, or maybe at the GNU Radio conference in September, um, but certainly probably by the end of the year, it won't really see any more updates um, or of any kind, any any um, backported bug fixes, any security fixes, anything like that. Um, so 3.8 is kind of on its way out. And then there's 3.9 is the next major version number. And that's also actively used, but it's also going to be deprecated probably by the end of the year <clears throat> as well. Um, and then the next version is 3.10, and that's the version 
That's kind of the long-term support version at this point. The intention is that 310 will, will stay as the primary <clears throat> version of GNU Radio that's actively developed and maintained until version 4 comes out. Version 4 will probably be the next major version of GNU Radio. There's no intention to make a 311, although it could happen. It depends how long uh, it takes to develop 4, a GNU Radio version 4. And so 310 is where all the sort of action is. It's where the long-term support is. Um, it, it, in, in, depending on exactly what you're doing, it's probably the version you want to use. Um, but uh, I think someone just um, joined the Google Meet. So excuse me, let me just admit these people into the meeting. Um, OK, uh, let me come back to this. Um, and so these, uh, the, the, the 3.10 version is the primary version that, that, that the community is using these days and will be maintained going forward uh, until version 4. Um, and I'll show you how you can switch versions and things like that shortly. Um, so, so that's GNU Radio, uh, the version numbering. And so coming back here, um, here, coming back here, you'd, you'd select whichever version you were interested in using, 3.8 or 3.7 is kind of old. Again, I don't recommend using 3.7 anymore unless there's some, some older software that you need to support. Uh, and then there's 3.9, and I don't think they have the 3.10 instructions up yet. But um, oh, I'm sorry. This is for um, Ubuntu 18.04, which is an older version of Linux. And, and so is these versions here, 16 and 14. These are much older. And the reason they're mentioned is really for legacy reasons, because 3.7 is hard to run on newer versions of, of uh, Ubuntu. And so um, the only real reason to even mention those older versions of Ubuntu is if you're having to use um, GNU Radio 3.7. Otherwise, you really should be using a newer version. I think I'd recommend these days, or sort of the, um, the most, the most uh, widely used, most commonly used version is 2004 and now 2204. 2204 came out back in April, so it's relatively new. Uh, but those would be the versions I would use. If if you're using GNU Radio 3.7, uh, then you could use, or you would have to use, uh, an older version of, of Ubuntu. And so that's why those are mentioned there. Um, there's also a few other steps here. There's an environment variable that you would set if you're using um, PyQt which is a Python binding for the Qt library. And so you would just set that before you do the, the, the build. And the way you actually um, build from source code, again, after you install all these dependencies, if you're building from a binary package, then all you need to do is this. This will install whichever version corresponds to the version in the um, repository for your version of Ubuntu. Uh, and then after you do that, you're 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 done. You can you can use GNU Radio, but if you're building from source code, then there are some steps you'll you'll have to take. And let me show you those. I have a a script here, and let me just highlight. Um, I'm going to skip the. This script is a, a small script I wrote that uh, boils down all of the steps to building GNU Radio into these uh, commands here. I also included some things for UHD, which is the device driver for uh, the USRP radio, and maybe I'll talk about that another time. Um, for now, I'll assume that that's either done or or you're not interested in doing it. We don't have to do it. I'll just focus on the GNU radio part. And let me, um, I don't know, I, I, I hope the text is visible. I don't know if it's large enough. Uh, just, just let me know if it's not. Um, but I'll focus just on this part. And so for for installing from source code, in this case, I'm showing 385. It's It's the version that I had been using. But this applies to any any of the versions I mentioned, 3.8, 3.9, or 3.10. And uh, um, uh, th there's actually a footnote to what I just said. I just realized when I said that there's actually one thing that will be different, and I'll explain that in a moment. But when you're building um, GNU Radio 3.8, um, you'll follow these commands, and, and this general sort of recipe is what you'll see uh, sort of over and over again. Um, where you clone a repository, the GNU Radio repository, you make a build folder, you check out a particular version. This command I'll come back to. And then you uh, run CMake, you run make, and then you do a make install. And I'll explain these commands as we go through them. 
let's do this for three eight, and then I'll explain um, something that's changed for three nine and for three ten, uh, three ten. <clears throat> I'll start here by going into my um, South Indian SDR users group event four folder, and I'll make this screen larger in case it's hard to see. Let me know if, if that text is still too small. Just um, somebody can just shout out at me. I don't have my chat up. Still small on oh, the mobile view. Okay, okay. That's probably as big as I can make it without losing screen size. Is that is that better? Is, can you does that work? Okay. I think if I make it larger, then I my screen becomes too large. Sorry. Okay. Is that is that better? Hopefully that's better. 3db, Mr. Um, 3db. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, let me also zoom this text as well. And let's take a look at these commands one by one. So the first is to create a, a folder called git from your home directory. Um, it's not strictly necessary that you use that folder. In this case, I'm not. I'm in my uh, folder here, desktop, under my home directory, and then uh, in this folder, sisdrug event four. And we can see that with that command there. That's the folder that I'm in right now. And I'll go ahead and create um, a folder called git, as well. Keep all of the cloned repositories that I will, uh, you know, the repositories that I will clone. And then the next command is to actually clone the repository for Gnu Radio. So let's do that. And what does that do? Well, I won't explain the nuances about this because in the Git version control system, it's a little different from uh, other version control systems you might have used, like uh, CVS, the old CVS system, or uh, Subversion. Um, Git is a distributed version control system, but basically what it's doing is copying the repository. And so now I have a local copy um, of that repository. And the way you do the copy is with the, the clone command. That's where the word clone comes in. And then you simply give the URL of um, the repository and that git file, that dot git file. And that will tell it uh, to, to clone or copy that repository locally. And so now if I look at my folder, um, it's not empty anymore. I have a, a folder called GNU Radio, which is a git repository. You might also have noticed there's this dash dash recursive part of the command here. And what that does is it recursively clones the repository. So there are actually submodules, or there can be submodules inside of a repository. And in the case of GNU Radio in version 3.8, there is a submodule for something called Volk, V-O-L-K, which is basically an assembly language optimized series of DSP operations. And that library is a submodule, and it's required for GNU Radio. So we clone it um, recursively. So that way, we get the uh, the Volk sub uh, sub uh, submodule as well. If we don't do that, then we can't actually build GNU Radio. It won't work. It requires that to be there. OK, the next step is to go into that folder. And you can see here um, all the different files in the folder. And you'll notice that this. Uh, folder structure matches what's in the repository because we cloned it, because we copied it. I'll move the window over to the side. You can see it a little bit better. But there are all these GR folders here. You can you can see them here as well. Uh, you know, there's a docs folder, a CMake folder, a dtools folder, and so on. And you see all of those um, also listed here locally on my system. Um, so the next step, once we are in the uh, repository, is to make a build folder. And the way building a lot of these open source tools, like a new radio or GQRX or the UHD driver for the for the USRP radios, the way they work is they use a tool called CMake, which we'll talk about in just a second. And um, with CMake, um, when you invoke CMake, it will generate a whole bunch of build products, a whole bunch of files and folders. And those can get messy. And so we try to keep those in its own folder so it doesn't make the rest of the repository you know, messy with, with additional files and folders. And the folder doesn't have to be called build. 
but by convention, people call it that. And what a lot of people also do is they'll name the folder um, with the version that they're they're wanting to build. It doesn't mean that your build or your build process is limited to just that version, but a lot of times people will um, will do that, and um, that way they can immediately see what version they built, and they can use multiple build folders, one for each version, um, and that can be really useful sometimes. So in this case, I'll use the tag that I'm going to build with, that 3.8.5.0 tag, that V3.8.5.0 tag is the one that I'll build. So I'll name the build folder that. And then I'll go into the build folder. And then the next thing we do is we can check out that version. Because right now, we've cloned the repository, but we're still using what's called the head of the master branch. We're not actually using version 3.8.5. So we have to tell Git to do that. And so we will tell it to check out that tag. And so now uh, we are using 3.8.5. The output doesn't really cleanly say that. It's a little maybe sometimes hard to know that you've used a different version. There's a message up at the top that says note switching to, uh, to that tag name. Um, but it, it can be. Um, a little confusing if you're not used to get <clears throat> what this really means. It says, you know, you are in a de detached head state, you know, so you might think, you know, this is bad, right? Your head got cut off or something, your head got detached, and that's a bad thing. Um, all of that really just means that, um, you know, you're, you're not uh, using the head of the master branch. Uh, it also is telling you that, um, you know, you su successfully switched to, uh, to that tag and that, um, the hash that you're using is this hexadecimal number down here. And what's interesting is if you look at the repository and you switch to that tag, let's go and actually select that tag, 3.8.5.0. I just clicked it. Okay, now it's updated. You'll see here, this in GitHub shows you the hash. And so this number should match that number. Now, this only shows you, I think, I don't know, what is it, the first uh, eight hexadecimal digits or six hexadecimal digits, and this is showing you 10. Uh, hi, Neil. You, uh, you need to speed this up. We have only three minutes, two minutes before the next presentation. So. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, we might have to break this up into uh, another part three then. Um, I'll, 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 I'll finish up quickly. Thank you for the warning. Um, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so, so you, can, you can verify that you're using the correct version by looking at the hash. And these first uh, set of digits should match what you see here. And then the next command is this git submodule update. So what this does is it updates the Volk submodule. I told you that there was a submodule Volk that was required. That's why we had to clone the repository recursively. And then we do this init to initialize that, that submodule and make sure that um, we're using the correct version of that submodule, given the version of GNU Radio that we're trying to build with. So now this is, the submodule is now correct. So at this point, we can start the primary commands to make um, or build GNU Radio. And the first is CMake. And so we'll run CMake, and we run it with dot, dot, slash. And what that does, I'll just show something here quickly. In the folder above us, you'll notice there's a file called cmakelists.txt. That folder, that file rather, um, contains the top level commands for how to build GNU Radio. And so we need to run CMake and pass that file to it. Um, and so I'll go back to my build folder. I'll run CMake, and I'll tell it to look in the folder above for that file. By default, it looks for that file. I could specify that file uh, explicitly if I wanted to, or I could change its name and specify it. But by default, it'll look for that file. Now, what does CMake do? CMake makes the make files. Um, I'll explain what a make file is in a minute, but Neil, CMake. Hello? You have one minute. You have one minute. Okay. Well, if 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 we're that tight and we really want to end exactly at uh, the 15 minutes mark, then I, I should probably simply stop here. I'll just quickly mention that CMake makes the make files, and then make would build them using the make files that are generated, and then you would install the uh, compiled uh, binaries into your system and update the library cache, and then you would have uh, GNU Radio up and running. Um, with that, I'll stop here, right in the middle of this, 
Um, and then in the next event, I'll continue with a part three and we'll pick it up right from this point and uh, we'll continue um, with this as well as a, a whole bunch of other topics. Um, I apologize for running out of time, but um, thank you for joining. Um, I hope this was useful and uh, please, please stay tuned for the third part of this series. Um, I will finish the discussion on this and um, there's a bunch more points uh, to mention that I think you'll find interesting. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions for Neil, could you please post them on the Slack group or on the WhatsApp channel and we can answer them over there. Um, Um, I'm just looking at the Slack channel. It does look like there were a couple of questions. Um, let's see about, yeah, uh, I'm just going down the list. Uh, Deepak Inde was asking how to reduce uh, uh, GNU radio crashes on Windows. Yeah, uh, I basically use Radio Conda. It really has become, I would say, the standard way of installing on Windows. Um, that really is the tool to go to. Um, if you have any problems using it, um, join the GNU radio matrix Slack uh, chat channel, chat server. And there's uh, a lot of active people there who can help, um, or or post on the mailing list. Either one. There's a Gunner Radio mailing list uh, that's also active, and you can uh, post a message there, and some uh, and people will help you. Um, next question: How do we install multiple versions in the same system? I'll explain that in the next uh, part three. That was one of the things I was uh, you know uh, planning to talk about. That's one of the things on the uh, agenda. Um, so we'll cover it in part three of the uh, of the series. You're also asking, is it possible to cross compile? Yes, it is. People run GNU Radio on, say, like Raspberry Pi devices, which are using ARM CPUs. So yeah, you can definitely cross compile GNU Radio for other platforms. Um, Deepak also was asking about how to install um, out of three modules. So we will talk about that. That was something also uh, I was going to get to. So yes, we will in part three. We'll we'll look at uh, we'll look at out of three modules. Um, OK, I think that was it for questions, so I'll stop there. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, uh, feel free to email me. And uh, please, please come back and watch uh, part three in the next um, event. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Henry. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. Uh, now we have our next speaker uh, for this event. Uh, so this uh, talk is going to be about Silis, a language for hard coding algorithms into FPGA hardware by Dr. Sylvain Lefebvre. Dr. Sylvain Lefebvre is a senior researcher at INRIA France, where he leads the MFX team. His work focuses on algorithms for generating and processing complex shapes in oh, Upper, we just so now you. I would like to welcome Apa, uh, Apa, we just, lost lost you for a while. just lost you for a second there. Just, just rewind maybe yeah, 30 seconds sorry. and continue again. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Not a problem. Uh, so Dr. Sylvain Lefebvre is a senior researcher at uh, INRIA France, where he leads the MFX team. His work focuses on algorithms for generating and processing complex shapes in additive manufacturing using CPUs, FPGAs, and GPUs. He enjoys exploring computer graphic algorithms, making, and hacking things. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Sylvain Lefebvre once again to uh, our event four. Thank you uh, for presenting. So now I would like to hand over to you, Dr. Sylvain. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me correctly? Is that working? Yes. Yes, uh, okay. yeah, it's fine. Excellent, excellent. Yes, so let's yes. try to share the screen. So it says entire screen. I have two of them. I'm going to try to select the correct one. Yes, hopefully you can see the slides now. Yes, we do. Thank you. OK, that's great. I'm just going to do another quick test so that we don't have any bad surprise. Can you see the video on the left? Yes, I think yes. That's good. Yes. OK, excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, it, it's really great to uh, to be participating again. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you also for the introduction. Uh, I'm sorry to be interrupting uh, the uh, GNU radio uh, talk, which uh, sounded really good. So I'm, I'm 
I'm gonna try to catch up on the on the stream because I was preparing my slides before, and uh, to be there for part three. Um, so uh, yes, and I really like the detached head uh, Git thing, right? This happened to me quite a few times to end up in this situation. It's indeed a bit scary, but the thing with Git is you can recover from uh, trouble usually. Usually, um, all right. So uh, let's uh, get started with Silis. Uh, I will uh, give you today an update on the um, uh, you know the latest features and the latest uh, changes uh, in the language, and also some design highlights. So the structure of the, of the talk will be uh, quite simple today. Um, and you know, I want to take the time also to uh, show you how to design things uh, and maybe you know, go through less things, but uh, uh, more in depth. Um, so let's have a quick look at some of the, of the new features that uh, I developed in the, in the past few months. A, a lot happened, so I'm just gonna you know, cherry pick a few uh, things, but there's definitely uh, a, a lot more uh, in uh, the repository. Um, so perhaps one of the most important changes that uh, happened in Silis is that uh, uh, is the introduction of the units. Uh, so before in Silis, you would you would only write uh, algorithms, but as the language evolved, it was no longer really reflecting the uh, experience of designing with Silis. And and so I introduced this new notion of unit. Um, but fear not, nothing is broken, so your code uh, will still work as it used to work before. I'm very careful uh, with backward uh, compatibility, so uh, whenever I introduce changes, uh, they don't break uh, what used to work before. Uh, so the ideal way to write uh, a design now in, uh, in CDs is to start by writing a unit, which is called the main unit. Um, and then the algorithm that you see here is actually embedded into the unit, right? So not the unit keyword here. And then, uh, of course, this becomes a circuit as before. And then the algorithm is actually a sub part of this circuit. And that's because you can have more than just an algorithm uh, in a unit. And just as a crash course for those who might be new to, uh, to see this and haven't seen the, the prior talks, what's going to happen here is that we are creating a 24 bits unsigned counter. We're initializing, the, initializing it to zero when the uh, algorithm starts. And then uh, forever in a while loop, loop we are uh, copying the most significant bits, the so eight most sig significant bits from the counter into the LEDs, and then we increment the counter. And so what uh, this does is uh, called a blinky, and this is like the hello world of FPGA. So you will see the uh, LEDs on the uh, FPGA board just uh, blinking um, as the uh, counter is incremented. So again, this gets turned into a circuit, and this circuit em embeds an algorithm, which is uh, this one here. Um, and so now, if we, uh, you know, take a step back and look at the general structure of a unit in uh, CDs, you will uh, first find a block of uh, global declaration. So whatever you declare here, for instance, this variable A is going to be visible by everything else. Then you will find an always before block. So that's a piece of logic, which has to uh, be uh, applied in a single cycle. And this logic is uh, always applied before anything in the algorithm. So this before here means before anything in the algorithm. Then you will find the algorithm, which can be a multiple cycle thing. Here you can see there's a while loop, there's a step operator that is waiting one cycle and then even a break here from this loop. And then we have the always after block, which will describe logic that is applied every cycle, but after whatever uh, is going on in the algorithm. All right, and all of these blocks are optional. So you may uh, not have declarations, you may not have the always before, you may not have the always after, and you may even skip the algorithm. If you remove the algorithm, then both of these blocks will merge into a single always block because there's no notion of before and after since the uh, algorithm is not here anymore. All right, and there is a shortcut which will connect to the uh, previous syntax in CDs, which is if you have a unit which only has an algorithm, you can simply write algorithm main and then your algorithm. And this will this is actually the uh, prior syntax uh, of CDs, and it's still perfectly acceptable. Uh, it's just a case where you, you, you don't need the always before and always after blocks. All right, so if we take a second look at this syntax, uh, I think it highlights much better what CDs is about. Uh, because here what happens is that you have these one cycle always blocks of logic, which are uh, you know much more typical of uh, hardware design, and this is typically what you will find in, for instance, Verilog with the uh, always uh, blocks. Um, and uh, the cool thing uh, about CDs and what it lets you do is that these blocks can be uh, seamlessly uh, combined with the algorithm itself. So again, in these blocks, you have things that can be done in a single cycle, so you can't use any loops or any of the algorithm constructs. This is reserved for the algorithm. But then by you know, specifying what's before and what's after, you can get a best of both worlds situation where you both define your always logic 
and you position it with respect to the uh, algorithm where you describe your uh, imperative uh, uh, style uh, sequence of execution, right? And uh, I will show you an example of that uh, just after, but the cool thing is that you can seamlessly combine these two uh, approaches. Um, also, what happens very often is you will uh, actually prototype using an algorithm because it's very comfortable. And then as you want to optimize, you might want to get rid of the algorithm because of course it implies a finite state machine and multiplexers in the FPGA. And so you try to move the, log the logic uh, away into the always blocks. And sometimes you even can get rid of the algorithm entirely or you know, make it a very compact thing, which is actually very efficient. All right, let's uh, switch to an example. So I'm gonna uh, show you some code, which I prepared here. And uh, this design will actually make it run on this uh, FPGA. So this is an iStick FPGA. Uh, it's a very nice little board that plugs directly in a uh, USB port. And the FPGA you have uh, here is uh, by uh, Lattice. It's an uh, HX1K and it has uh, 1,280 logical elements. So it's fairly small, but you can still fit uh, a RISC-V uh, processor in there. And uh, we have talked about that last time with the uh, S5 Dual, but there are many other uh, uh, processors like Femto RV and some others that would fit uh, into the iStick. Um, and then it has these connectors. So this I soldered and I added after the fact, but the board comes with this uh, connector already soldered. This is called the P-Mode connector. And you can have a little uh, extension board that can plug in there. And I'm gonna show you later on how to use that. But for now, let's just plug the iStick in. So nothing happens because I haven't put any uh, design yet. And then I'm going to uh, start a command line that is here. Let me. Here's the screen, and we're just gonna do uh, make and invoke CDs on this uh, small example I was showing you. So right now it's uh, synthesizing the hardware. Now it's programming the board. You can see the LEDs are turning a little bit red. And then once this is done, it will take just a few seconds, you will see uh, a LED LED pattern here. So if you notice the pattern, it goes one way and then reverses, goes back inside here and then goes the other way, right? So it's like going uh, around in one direction and then back in the other direction. So to understand what's happening in this design, let's have a look at the uh, CD source file. So we have actually uh, three algorithms here. We have algorithm weight, left and right, and then we have the main unit. And the main unit is using both an algorithm and an always after block. So what are the algorithm about? Well, weight is a very simple algorithm, uh, which only purpose is to waste time. Uh, the problem is that this uh, FPGA is actually quite fast. It's uh, 12 megahertz. Um, and so if we don't slow it down, we, you, you, we wouldn't see the LED pattern. It, was, it would just go very, very fast, and we would just see uh, you know, the dimmed uh, LED uh, uh, always uh, turned on. Um, and so with uh, this weight, what we do is we have a counter on 24 bits. Uh, the counter is, uh, is initialized to zero when the algorithm starts. Then it is incremented until the uh, uh, most significant bit of the counter turns to one, which means this will increment for two to the power of 23 cycles uh, before this bit turns on, and then we exit the while loop and the algorithm is done, okay? Then we have the left and right algorithms. They're basically the same, so I'm just uh, going to describe the uh, left algorithm. So what this does is it has a single output on five bits, so there's one bit per LED on the FPGA, um, and then we initialize this output to uh, this bit vector here, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, and so that's one uh, that's what, what that means is that when we start, only the uh, LED uh, zero is uh, being turned on. And then in a while loop, we are shifting this bit to the left. So this is a bit shift, which means this bit will move uh, from the left to the right. Sorry, from the right uh, to the left is the opposite. It goes to the left uh, through the uh, left uh, bit shift by one bit every uh, time this is uh, reached. And this would uh, be every cycle if we didn't have this call. And this calls uh, w, W is an instance of the weight algorithm, and this is a blocking call. Here we do the call, here we join the algorithm, just as a reminder, if you missed the uh, previous talks. And so what this means is that we are calling the weight algorithm, and this will actually wait two to the power of 23 cycles before uh, the next iteration, right? So this will slowly move the bit to uh, the left, which is what we see in one of the directions. And then, of course, right does the opposite. You can see the shift direction is reverted. And also, the test is different, but it's basically just uh, the same with the bit going in the other direction. And finally, the main uh, unit. So the main unit has one output. These are the five bits of the five LEDs, one LED per bit. 
and uh, it instantiates two algorithms, uh, left and right, and these are, called, these are called L and R, uh, respectively. And then what the algorithm does is, in an infinite loop, this will loop forever, it calls left, and so left will move the bit slowly to the left, and then it calls right, and right will move the bit slowly back to the right, and this creates a pattern here. So now, if I look at this algorithm, the interesting thing is that it doesn't touch the uh, LED's output. So basically, this algorithm is not responsible for turning the LEDs on and off. It doesn't read the outputs of L and R. And the reason for that is because the algorithm is blocking, um, the code is blocking, sorry. When we are here, we are stuck uh, waiting for L to be executed. So we cannot really set the output LEDs. But for that, we can use an always after block because this always after block is always active. It is always applied uh, regardless of what the algorithm is currently doing. And so this is where we are actually setting the LEDs output. And so we do that using uh, a conditional assignment. This is this you know, question mark uh, colon operator that does, you know, if this condition is true, then this will be the value. Otherwise, this will be uh, what's after the, the colon. So here we have two of them nested. And what it says basically is if the L algorithm is not done, right? So if it is not, this reverses the condition, if it is not done, then it means it's running, it is running. So if it is running, we take its output L.V and we assign it to LEDs, right? And so when we are blocked here in the main algorithm, this actually is true. And so we are setting L.V to uh, the LEDs. And it's L.V because the instance of the algorithm is called L and this is the output V. Right, um, and so of course, if uh, left is not, uh, if L is not running, but R is running, this time we select R dot V and we set it to LEDs, and then if none of them are running, we simply preserve the value uh, of LEDs. And the reason we have to do that is because uh, when you do a call to an algorithm, there is a one-cycle latency before the algorithm starts, and a one-cycle latency after it is done before you uh, uh, get back the control in the calling algorithm. And so here we'll have one cycle before, one cycle after. Here we'll have one cycle before, one cycle after. And then there's one cycle to go back uh, to the start of the while loop, right? It iterates every cycle. Um, and so that means there are five cycles every iteration where none of the algorithms are running. And so we need to deal with this case and do something uh, with the LEDs. Um, honestly, this would go so fast that you would probably not see anything wrong, but it's just better to, to do it properly, right? And so that's it. This is the entire design. And you get this uh, uh, little pattern here uh, on the uh, LEDs. So let me switch back to the slides to discuss the uh, next uh, feature. So the next big feature that was um, added to CDIS, or more precisely that was, that was refined, are the pipelines. Uh, pipelines have been there from the start, but I was not uh, you know, very happy with the way they were. So for a while, they were just experimental. And now they are stable. Um, so they are stable, but they are not yet complete. There are a few things I want to add, but this basic syntax will uh, no longer change. And it's just there will be more, more flexibility in the future uh, in some advanced uh, usage of the pipelines. Um, so what is a pipeline? A pipeline is a very important concept in hardware design that, that lets you maximize uh, the uh, resources of your hardware while at the same time uh, creating very fast uh, um, hardware. And the idea is as follows. Here we have a three-stage pipeline. And here we have the time going on. So this is uh, you know first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, and so on. And uh, this is a workload traversing the pipeline. And the idea is here we have three different things to do on this uh, um, state uh, A, so on this input A. So A enters the pipeline on stage zero, and then it goes to stage one, and then it goes to stage two. But the idea here is that while, while A is on stage one, stage zero, stage, stage zero would be doing nothing, which is a waste. So instead of doing nothing, we can start right away feeding the next input into the pipeline. So that uh, at any time, all three stages will work until, of course, this is complete. And here, you know, stage zero is doing nothing again because we are done. So if you look at these three inputs, A, B, C traversing, at some point, we have uh, both of them into the pipeline with each stage being busy. So that's a very nice uh, way to uh, optimize your uh, your hardware and to make sure everything is used in the hardware. The only catch with this is what is called the latency, because you know it takes three cycles before uh, A exits the pipeline if the pipeline has uh, three stages. So the syntax is in uh, in uh, CDIS is very simple. You just create these blocks and then a rows between the blocks that describes that you want things to flow through the pipeline 
going along these rows until the final stage, right? And then the uh, important thing into the pipeline is how this information will flow, how these inputs will flow through the pipeline. And this is done automatically by CDs uh, um, uh, with the following idea. So if you have a, a variable here, A, and in a stage, let's say stage zero, you assign A, then A will start trickling down the pipeline. And what that means is that now every stage will have its own copy of A. So this is A on stage zero. And then stage one at the next cycle will see A as it was before at stage zero. And the same is true for stage two. It will see A as it was before at stage one. And these values will trickle down the pipeline in this manner progressively. Right? And so let's see what it means in terms of values. So here, let's look at this particular stage here. Stage one here is showing us that the value of A is manipulated three. And stage uh, two, which is further down the pipeline, is manipulating the previous value, which was the value two, right? And then at the next cycle, two is receiving three, which is the output of stage one. Uh, and then one is receiving four, which is the output of stage zero before, right? So you can, you can, re you can see the same construct as what we had before. And this is all done automatically uh, by uh, CDs. So the only thing you need to keep in mind are the rules of when you assign, then the values will start uh, going down through the pipeline. Um, and then, of course, there's a way to prevent this capture because sometimes you don't want this to happen. So here, if you use this uh, V syntax, which, which in fact uh, is symbolizing an arrow pointing down, uh, then what this means is I don't want the value to start trickling down the pipeline. I want the value to be assigned and to exit the pipeline uh, by the bottom here. And so what that means now is that if you do this assignment to A, A doesn't trickle down the pipeline. Then at the next cycle, all the stages which are after stage zero are going to see uh, the change in A. And this is important because sometimes in pipelines, uh, one stage has to tell the other stages that something happened. For instance, if you design a CPU, you might have what, what's called data hazards. And then you need to tell the entire pipeline, oh, there's a, a specific condition now, and everybody has to be aware of this condition at the next cycle. And this is what the syntax is doing. All right, and with only these, you can already, already do uh, uh, non-trivial designs. And one of these uh, designs that I created, and that is, of course, in the repository, is a pipelined uh, RISC-V uh, CPU. So it has four stages. I won't go into all the details, of course, of that, because that's a, a pretty advanced topic. But I just want to highlight, uh, first, that this CPU is faster. You can see it running at the top. And you can see that it's uh, uh, going uh, faster in the same code than the non-pipeline version. And that's normal because, of course, it is able to output uh, one instruction every cycle in ideal conditions when there's no uh, hazard, whereas the other uh, CPU is limited to, four, uh, to one instruction every four cycles. Right? And here you can see the stages of the pipeline. There are four of them. And you can recognize the syntax with the arrow that says go from one stage to the next. And for instance, if we look at uh, stage one here, we can see the program counter and the instruction being assigned, which means these uh, two variables are going to trickle down the pipeline. So here, we, when we read them at stage two, we are reading them as they were in stage one at the cycle before. Right? And this goes down like this. And all stages are active all the time and uh, processing their, uh, their input. All right. Um, the next topic I would like uh, to mention is uh, the use of uh, in-house. So here we're going to have a, a little bit of fun, and we uh, are going to uh, construct a design uh, together uh, from this uh, uh, iStick FPGA. So uh, what an in-out is, um, is in fact uh, relating to the pins uh, of the uh, FPGA. So uh, on most FPGAs, the pins are configurable to be either inputs or outputs. And I want to show you how you can uh, do that from CDs. This is also um, um, a feature that has been refined and that is now working uh, very well. Um, and so here on this FPGA, for instance, on the P mode, uh, you have a number of um, uh, pins here on, onto which I can uh, connect these uh, little uh, jump wires. Um, and uh, the uh, eight pins here at the bottom are actually pins which you can configure as either input or uh, output. The pins at the top, the two pins here are ground, and the two pins above are VCC. How do I know that? Because I read the uh, data sheet of the uh, iStick that you can find online, where this is all explained. Uh, also, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little mark here, a little triangle here at the bottom, which is uh, uh, noting that this is actually pin number one. So I know that pin number one is uh, one of the configurable uh, in-out pin, and then I have four of them like that from one to four, and then uh, the other ones are here, all right? 
Um, so what we are going to do is we're going to we're going to use a set of wires. Here they are, jump wires. We are going to use uh, a little button, right? This push button here, and that will uh, be uh, our uh, input. Uh, I need one uh, more little wire. You'll see why uh, just in a minute. And then we use one resistor and uh, one uh, LED. So uh, of course uh, the the goal will be to turn the LED on. If you plug an LED into your outputs, you absolutely need a resistor to limit the current. Otherwise, you uh, risk to burn the uh, LED and worse to damage the FPGA. Right. So always put a little resistor. I computed the value so that I have 20 um, milliamps going through the uh, LED, which uh, I took from the LED specifications. Uh, but really, any resistor start high, and 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 you will be safe. Um, and of course, we're going to use uh, we are going to use a breadboard to uh, assemble all of this. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to just power on the uh, LED using the FPGA as the power source because I want to make sure uh, everything is, is fine in terms of the uh, ground and VCC without risking uh, damaging the inputs and outputs. So I know uh, that this pin here at the top is uh, VCC. So I'm going to put this uh, jump wire here and I put it here at the top on the breadboard. Uh, and if you are not familiar with breadboards, what happens is that the entire line here will be uh, VCC now. Uh, and then I'm going to plug ground here, which I know is the ground uh, pin. And I will uh, put ground here at the bottom. I like to have them cleanly separate so that I, I don't do any mistakes when uh, plugging things. OK. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is to put the uh, LED here in the middle. So remember that the LED has two. Um, of course, of the two here, the bigger one, the longer one is the one that receives uh, the plus uh, voltage, the positive voltage. So I'm going to put it maybe here to the left. OK, there it is. And then I'm going to use this little uh, red wire here to connect the VCC to the uh, LED. If I manage to put that in place, it's not completely easy while on camera. Let me check. Yeah, there we go. OK. No, nope, doesn't want to go in. Aha, of course, this has to happen, right? <laughs> this little wire is being stubborn. Let me turn that around. It will be a bit easier. OK. There we go. And don't forget the resistor. Of course, this will be the, the last part uh, that will close the uh, the loop so that we can power uh, our LED. All right. So now what's going to happen is uh, really I'm just using the FPGA as a power source, right? So when I plug it in here, uh, what the FPGA does is it has a little regulator and uh, it will turn on the, uh, it will uh, apply some power here, which will be 3.3 volts in this case. And it goes there, goes through the LED, goes through the resistor, and we're fine. We have the LED uh, lit up. So um, now that I know that uh, I plug that properly, we are going to construct a little circuit so that we can uh, make use of the uh, in-outs on uh, the actual FPGA. So to do that, I'm going to unplug the FPGA before doing anything. And then I will uh, remove this little red wire. And I will put uh, the button here next to it. OK? And so. Uh, what I want to do now is to use uh, the uh, one of the uh, pins as an output to power the LED, right? So I'm going to use the uh, pin, which is here at the bottom left. This is pin uh, one on the uh, FPGA. Yes, that is properly plugged. Uh, and so that will be a bit zero on the uh, uh, P-mode uh, output. And this I will put directly here, which means I'm actually uh, powering the LED uh, from the output, which will be fine uh, with the uh, resistor here in place. And then the next thing I want to do is to sense the uh, button, uh, uh, whether the button is pressed or not. So I'm going to put uh, this wire here, right, and directly plug it to another pin of the P mode, which will be pin uh, one. OK. And so what's going to happen here is that if uh, there's nothing, if the button is released and there's, uh, it's basically unplugged, uh, then, because there is a pull down resistor on the uh, input, I will see zero. And so, to see uh, a one when I press the button, I need to uh, have a VCC flow through the button into uh, the input. And I'm going to achieve that by adding back this little red wire. Hopefully, it will be nicer this time. Yes, there we go. OK, and now I have the red wire here. So, if I press this button, I'm closing a circuit from VCC into uh, the input. And that will uh, give me. Uh, the readout that the button uh, is pressed. All right, hopefully you can uh, see that here. So I won't plug it right away. First, we're going to uh, do uh, our design. So I'm switching back to see this. I have uh, an empty <coughs> file here, and we're going to start uh, this design. So it's going to be unit main. 
I need to have the, um, the uh, LED output because it's expected by uh, the CBIS framework for this board. And then I'm using in out U int 8 P mode, right? And this will allow to configure each of the eight individual pins of the P mode uh, and control whether they're inputs or outputs. So I will have an always unit. Ah, by the way, something I should do is I'm not going to use the LEDs. I should give them a value. So I'm just going to do that. So that's their uh, set to zero, and we don't have the uh, LEDs uh, turning on. Um, and then in always here, I'm going to say pmode dot o enable, and that's how you use the in out uh, pins in CDs. And o enable because this is uh, uint eight in out has uh, is actually a vector of eight bits, and I'm going to say bit zero. So this is from bit zero for one bit. So this is bit zero. Uh, is going to be turned to one because I'm configuring the output. This is output enable, and I'm saying I want this pin which corresponds to pin zero. This is a white wire here. I want it to be an output. Then I'm going to do the same with the next pin, saying that I want pin one here to be an input. So output enable is, is zero, which means it's actually going to be an input. And then it's super simple. I just need to do pmod.o, the output vector, for the first bit is going to track the pmod.i, which is the input for the second bit. And that should be it. Now, what happens is I have configured an output, an input, and I'm copying the input into uh, the output uh, all the time. right? And so if we uh, compile this design, here's the console again. There we go. It's going to uh, configure the FPGA, and we should have the right thing if the FPGA is plugged, <laughs> which, of course, it wasn't. There we go. So. It's OK here, in this particular case, to plug it with the wires and everything. But otherwise, I would advise to program the FPGA without the wires and then plug the wires so that you have your program in place before uh, doing anything, just in case, right? Um, but here, I've done that before, so I know it's fine. And now, if I press the button, we can see the LED turning on, right? So again, I'm sensing the button from this pin here and driving the output uh, by copying the uh, input to the output in the series design. You can see that's very compact. So now these um, in-out pins, I've used them uh, extensively, including to talk to spy flash memory or to uh, pseudo SRAM through uh, spy as well, uh, and driving all sorts of devices. And so they are uh, working quite nicely now. Um, and uh, But of course, if you have any trouble with it or understanding exactly precisely how they work, especially in terms of latencies and so on, uh, please let me know. They are all uh, registered uh, by default in CDs. Uh, so uh, you will uh, get a, a one cycle latency between when you write that and when it's actually reflected. Uh, on the pins. All right, back to the slides. And let's now uh, just uh, talk about uh, what I won't mention uh, in details. Uh, there are a lot more features being added. Uh, some features that I really like, but uh, that would require more time to, to discuss are uh, some uh, genericity. So you can uh, uh, write auto in your inputs or out and outputs, and the type will depend on how you use how you instantiate the algorithm. You can use same as with stuff to uh, inspect your uh, variables. Uh, the preprocessor now can be run when you instantiate something so that it can adjust the uh, uh, unit to how it is being used uh, in the uh, host uh, unit. And there's a Python API also that allows, in, uh, that allows to interrupt with uh, LaTeX uh, and Amaranth and Megan and all the other uh, Python-based uh, HDF. Uh, there's a brand new tutorial. It's being written as we speak, but uh, it's uh, it's um, online since maybe a week or so. It has already 14 entries. If you want to learn about this, please go there and start from that. This is really uh, the most up-to-date uh, tutorial, and I'm adding more entries uh, progressively. Also, as you know, with CIS, it's all about the design. I just want to highlight a few uh, new designs that are in the repository. There are many of them, of course. Um, there's the uh, you know driving a NeoPixel, quite a classic, but very uh, nicely done from an FPGA. Uh, there's also, you know, driving a spy screen with a little RISC-V demos. Um, there is uh, the IS-5 family of uh, uh, RV32i processors that I do. We talked about the dual core last, last time, and there are three new entries in there. Please refer to the page uh, for the details. And then I really want to give a big shout out to this design, which is not done by, by me. This is done by uh, Rob MG15 on GitHub, and it's a, a, a very complete and very impressive design entirely written in CDs. Uh, that is basically a computer uh, with uh, a very complete uh, RISC-V processor, uh, FPU, GPU, audio, SD card, UART, all sorts of peripherals. And uh, Rob is doing incredible games uh, using that. He has a Doom port. I mean, it's, it's, it's really 
really very impressive. So please check it out. It's uh, all on GitHub and it's meant for the uh, ULX3S board, which is a great um, development board and very well supported by CIS as well. So thumbs up to Rob, who is also um, a, you know, a user that gives a lot of feedback and made a lot of suggestions, uh, helping shaping, shaping up CIS uh, as it is uh, nowadays. And then there's this uh, GPU I'm working on. I won't um, uh, give you too many details. Uh, it's all in this repository and I have a YouTube talk where uh, I discuss it a little bit more. I just want to show you um, the demo. This is, I was lucky to um, uh, participate uh, in making some demos for this uh, badge, which is uh, the uh, MCH uh, 2022 Hacker Camps badge that uh, just happened uh, a few days back. Um, and here you can see the uh, GPU running and making this uh, 3D triangle demo, all written in CDs, uh, including the RISC-V processor running there. And you can see it's quite smooth and it's running on the badge. Um, so I'm, I'm currently documenting the repository, uh, but if you're interested, you can go there for, uh, for a quick preview. I don't know if it's very fluid in the video feedback, but you have to believe me that this runs perfectly smoothly uh, in, uh, on the real hardware. All right, I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the community, which is doing fantastic work, both for CDs, but for all the uh, open source tool chain. I mean, the, this is uh, really uh, amazingly and insanely great work that is being done here. It's very active, very nice community. So please uh, start uh, doing your own hardware and reach out to the community. Uh, people are super helpful and, and always very happy to, to you know, help you advance and, and, and learn more about hardware design. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any question. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple of questions, uh, Dr. Sylvain. Mm -hmm. So the first question is from YouTube. All so right. when you say best of both worlds, and then we are combining logic and algorithm together, doesn't it mean we are focusing more on any logic and less on computer-driven calculations? This is by Cold Hand Gamer. Um, right. So. If I correctly, can you just repeat the last part? Does it mean I am focusing more on? Uh, doesn't it doesn't it mean we are focusing more on any logic and less on computer driven calculations? Maybe Cold Hand Gamer can clarify. No, no, I see. I think it's clear. Well, uh, I mean, yeah. yes and no. Right. <laughs> Sorry for the uh, um, um, uh, answer here, which is not very precise. But I think the way I understand the question is, um, you know. So whether you focus on computation or not, and whether uh, you are doing logic or algorithms, uh, in my opinion, are two different things, right? You can do logic that does computation. Um, it's just that, to me, it's more in, in which mindset you are, right? Some things are easier expressed in terms of imperative uh, programming, where you have to think in terms of a sequence of steps happening one after the other. And to me in particular, and I think for a lot of people who have programming background, it's, it's just a bit easier on the mind to grasp. But really, this entire thing gets turned into logic anyway, right? So you could also write exactly the same thing in just an always block, and, and it's absolutely uh, possible. And in a way, this is what CDs does uh, when it compiles to, to Verilog. Um, so it, it really depends on your mindset and the way you want to approach your problem. I would say that if you want to be very hardware efficient, minimize resources, and try to really you know, optimize things, you tend to switch back from the algorithm into the always blocks. That's what happens usually when I optimize, because I really want to you know, carefully tweak everything. And the algorithm are just a way to be more comfortable and, and more at ease. Um, and then whether you do computations or not, I mean, it really depends what you put in these algorithms. Um, and what type of computations you want to do, but there's no real reason you couldn't fit it in there. It's, it's more or less easy. That's, that's the thing, though. I hope I'm answering the question, right? But Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, there is another question, Dr. Sylvain, and uh, this is, the question is, what are the supported boards? Also, is there a, a procedure to use CILIS on unsupported boards? Absolutely. Uh, yes, and yes. So, so supported boards, uh, quite a few. Um, here I have a DE10 Nano, which is a fairly big uh, uh, board. This is the one used by the Mr. FPGA project. This one is actually not fully supported by the open source tool, but uh, CDs through Idealize can also talk to the uh, vendor tools, uh, which in this case is Quartus from uh, Intel to, to program the board. 
Then we have the uh, mighty uh, icebreaker that is here connected to a screen. Uh, great, uh, great little bomb to, to start with. It's um, a bigger FPGA than the, um, than the uh, ice stick I've shown. It's uh, 5,000 uh, um, uh, logical elements, uh, which is quite good. And then we have uh, the um, uh, ULX uh, 3S here, which I, I also highly recommend. Sorry, it's in a bag. I have to take it out. Whoops. There it is. Right, so it's a, it's also a, a really great board, okay. but there are many more. Uh, there's a, you know I I won't give the full list. It's, it's it would be too long, but there's many more, and there is a tutorial in the repository in the directory, which is frameworks boards, which explains to you how to add your own board. And I'm happy to help with the process. So feel free to reach out for that. Yeah, yeah, sure, uh, Doctor Sylvain. Thanks, thanks for answering those questions. Uh, also, those really help. Uh, also, are there any pending issues or something you would want, uh, like an announcement you would want to make to the community for some help on for the development? Yes, I think, I mean, so definitely, uh, you know, watch out for this uh, GPU stuff. Uh, I'm going to develop that further. It's fairly advanced things, but but really fun to play with. And I'm, I'm going to try to document that in a way that makes it approachable for beginners who are interested in computer graphics and hardware design and want to learn about this. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is um, th there will be some improvements, for instance, um, you know, in this um, example here, uh, where I put the in-out uh, wind P mode, I actually have to modify the make file so that it knows I have a P mode, and this will get automatized at some point, right? So there's a lot. I think CDs overall, as it is now, has reached, you know, some reasonable degree of maturity, but there's a lot of uh, additional things to make it more comfortable to use and improve. You know, build system and, and various aspects. Also, the error messages, I haven't talked about that, but it's much better now at finding potential issues in your uh, hardware design, like combinational cycles and all sorts of things like that, um, um, and so on, right? So, uh, and if you want to follow the news, please follow me on Twitter or, or uh, you know, go onto the GitHub and uh, see the repository and, and subscribe to the, uh, to the updates, and, and you will see uh, things are happening uh, uh, quite regularly. <laughs> Sure, Dr. Sylvain. Thank you so much for the uh, uh, amazing presentation today. Uh, and uh, for the this is yeah, this is for the audience that uh, anyone who wants to know more about the uh, Silis project, they can also you know refer to our event one where uh, Dr. Sylvain gave an introductory uh, session on Silis. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Dr. Sylvain. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, uh, Balaji, can you? Uh, share the presentation thanks yes yeah, so our next speaker for uh, tonight is uh, uh, Cory Koval and his talk is going to be on RF geolocation for everyone so Cory uh, is a maker and RF enthusiast from Maryland USA you can find often uh, you can often find him working on projects from his local maker spaces or developing challenges for the RF hacker century so today we are very glad to have you, Cory, uh, and uh, thank you uh, for agreeing to present here at our event today. So the stage is yours. Yeah, good evening or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Can you hear me OK? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Let me uh, share my screen here. Uh, looks like we are having some connectivity issues from Corey's end. Uh, 
Uh, there seems to be some technical difficulties. Please hold on. Try and get Mr. Oriko all back on. Yeah. Echo, you're on uh, sort of mute. Try this again. There we go. Can you see that okay? Yep. All good. All yeah. good. All right, perfect. Um, so a few years ago, um bought a piece of hardware called the Kerberos SDR, which is um basically a coherent SDR platform. It has a few receivers in one box and they're all clocked together. So you can look at the signals off of those and determine a few different things about the phase information. Uh, the thing I was primarily interested in was doing radio direction finding with it. Um, it had an Android app and a few other things to go along with it. Um, but I wanted a little bit more, so I sought out to make um, kind of a desktop uh, radio di direction finding application. Um, so let's start off with who I am. Uh, so I'm an RF enthusiast. Um, been working with SDR for quite a few years now. Um, I've don't, I don't really come from industry. Uh, I work in the IT field uh, for my day job. Um, involved in an organization called the RF Hacker Sanctuary. Um, so if you've ever been to something like DEF CON and you've seen the Wireless Village or the RF Village, uh, what we do is we run a capture to flag competition. Uh, people can come in. Uh, there's all sorts of different challenges with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, software-defined radio. And it allows people to learn new skills, kind of learn new things that they wouldn't otherwise touch. Um, been doing radio direction finding, fox hunting, that sort of stuff for a few years. Uh, kind of goes along with my ham radio hobby. Uh, contributed towards both the Kerberos SDR and the Kraken SDR software. And I'm developer of DF Aggregator, which we're going to talk about today. Um, so let's start off with what is radio direction finding. Um, it's basically the process of figuring out where a signal is coming from. So you different ways to do it. You could use a directional antenna. Um, you could use phase information. You can use amplitude information. There's all sorts of different ways to go about it. Um, from that, you'll get something called a lob or a line of bearing. And then you can, what you'll do is you'll take that information and you'll kind of combine it all together and eventually come out with a result of an approximate location of a transmitter. Um, so just some example uh, sensors that you would use with the Kerberos SDR uh, on the left side is a fixed antenna I have on my back porch. And on the right side is something I built to go on the top of my car. Um, my car has a glass roof, so mag mount antennas don't stick to that very well. Uh, so I had to get creative and came up with something that would attach to where you'd normally put a roof rack for luggage. Um, so what is DF Aggregator? So it's an open source, network-capable direction finding software. Uh, it collects lobs from multiple different sen from multiple sensors, and is meant to combine that information together and work out where the transmitter is coming from. And primarily, it's there to display all that information on a map and kind of just give you good insight, good like a really quick way to figure it out. Um, it's available on GitHub. Uh, the GitHub link is there. I could also probably have that put in the chat later. Um, DFA is not a command and control software. It does not have any control over the radio itself. It simply receives that data from it. And it's not meant to do any other sort of mapping other than um, put the where the transmitter is on the map. Um, so this kind of been a journey to uh, to get to this point. I um, had to learn quite a few things to make this happen. Um, of course, I had to start with a goal, like what did I want to build? I wanted a nice, clean inter interface. Um, if you looked at some other um, RDF software out there, um, you'll see that they tend to put lob lines all over the place and leaves them there on the map. And, then, and to me, that's a mess, and you can't really tell what's going on. Um, I needed to have simple controls, just not too many knobs to turn. 
um, make it accessible from web browser. Uh, I'm a big fan of being able to load up, whether it's on a cell phone, on a laptop, on a tablet, just being able to pull up a browser and connect to something and have full control of it from there. Um, needed to be compatible with Kerberos SDR and similar units. And I wanted to make it free and open for everyone. So here's an example on the left side of the kind of view that I don't like. Um, without that little red pin there, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. Like, how do you get to that result? So the goal was to get to something more like what's on the right side there. And kind of eliminate all those lob lines and just put down kind of a circle like, hey, it's the transmitters in this spot somewhere. Um, so I had a few obstacles to overcome. Uh, by default, the Kerberos SDR software did not provide any location information. Um, when the developers of the Kerberos SDR themselves put that put out their software, they meant for people to use their cell phone, and they always assumed that the cell phone would be co-located with the receiver. Um, for what I want to do, that wasn't going to be the case. Uh, so there's a pretty popular software suite out there for Linux called GPSD. Um, works with pretty much any serial or USB GPS. You plug it in, and it just uh, basically provides um, GPS to any software that requests it. Um, I'm not much of a programmer, so I had to learn Python. I didn't have any other code to to kind of use as a basis for this. And uh, since I couldn't be out on the road all the time collecting lobs in order to develop the software, I needed a way to come up with test data sets. So I actually had to build a data simulator, um, which depending on the input parameters I put in, it was able to, in real time, generate lobs. Um, so step zero, we needed to be able to collect the data and store it. So that was pretty easy. The Kerberos SDR software put, um, has an XML data format. Um, by default, it had very limited data. It had basically had your, your lob, um, it had a confidence value, and there was one other piece of information it had, I can't remember, but I had to add location data, timestamp, other stuff to it. Um, found that the best way to store the data was to use a SQLite database. Uh, SQLite databases are very fast, very compact. They don't take up a whole lot of disk space. Um, seemed like a much better option over something like a CSV file. And finally, to display it, I had to come up with a a good mapping software to use. At first, I tried Google Earth. Um, Google Earth did not really work well. Once you get too many data points on the map, it crashes the software. Um, I also looked into some other mapping software like Leaflet. And I, I just wasn't a big fan of the two-dimensional view. So to get into 3D space, I found something called CCMJS, which is an open source mapping utility. It was uh, very easy to interface with. Uh, worked very well in the browser because it was all JavaScript based. And another thing, which was a plus for me, what I wanted to do, it was able to um, render ellipses without doing anything special in the software. It was already part of the standard API that it has. All right, so now that we have the data, we need to do something with it. We need to compute the intersections. Um, First, we had to go off the basis that the Earth is round, because um, if you just compute it all in a straight line, you tend to lose accuracy over longer distances. Um, to compute the intersections over longer distances, you use something called great circle intersections. And it basically draws a complete line around the entire circumference of the Earth. Now, when you do that, you actually end up with two intersection points, one close to you, probably the one you want, and the one on the other side of the Earth. Uh, so you just use the software to pick the one that's closer to you. Um, you can do it with, uh, if you just use two receivers, you get one point out. But if you use three or more, you end up with multiple uh, intersection points. And I found that if you just take the average of those, it comes out um, pretty accurate, pretty close to where it needs to be. Um, I've tried some weighted averages based on um, things like the confidence value or the receive power. And I find it actually didn't make all that much of a difference to use a weighted average. Um, so how did the great circle uh, stuff work out? I'd say pretty well. 
Um, that's a transmitter over 21 kilometers away, and the lob line um, came in within about 100 feet of the tower, which actually I found pretty impressive. Um, that was from that antenna I had on my back porch from the earlier slide. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't draw any intersections here because I only had one receiver out. Um, so next thing you do, now that you have all those intersections, you need to do something with that data. So you need to estimate clusters, kind of figure out where they're all bunched up. Um, you need to take the human element out of this. You can't rely on a person to look at a whole bunch of dots on a map and say, oh, there's more of them over here. It might be here. Um, so I found an algorithm called dbscan, uh, density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise. And basically, it take, picks a set of points. Um, there's a value called minimum points, basically how many points need to be that close together. And then a value called epsilon is how far the nearest neighbor. And based on that, it's able to kind of draw those. Uh, well, you'll see in the next slide. And basically figure out where the, it's most dense and where all the related clusters are. Um, I've, had, I've tried a few other clustering algorithms, like uh, k-means and another one. I can't remember what it was called. but I didn't quite get the results um, that I was looking for. Uh, and then from there, I needed to figure out how to do uh, auto auto estimate the epsilon value, because that varies greatly um, from one data set to another. And trying to rely on a human to pick that value out uh, can yield a wide variety of results from complete garbage to kind of OK. I found a paper online that uh, outlined how to do this. Uh, and actually ended up being pretty easy to implement in software. And then also found that uh, this, uh, this clustering algorithm, algorithm is very memory intensive. Um, I've crashed the software a couple of times trying to compute uh, more than 20,000 intersections. Uh, my laptop can do a bit more than that with 16 gigs of RAM. But if you want to run this on something like a Raspberry Pi, uh, 20,000 intersections is about 1 gig of RAM uh, memory usage. Um, so here's kind of a sample data set, uh, no clustering applied. All those little dots in the map are intersection points. Um, so you apply a clustering algorithm, and it eliminates a significant majority of them. And then finally, uh, to clean up the map even more, instead of looking at all those little dots, um, you draw an ellipse kind of around where they're at, and then you can take those dots away. and that. Green dot in the center, the center dot ellipse is probably within about one to 200 feet of the actual transmitter. Um, finally, we need a way to filter through the data sets. Um, so I built a way into the software to identify areas of interest or AOIs. Um, basically says, I know this transmitter's around here somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but I want you to focus on looking at the spot and kind of get rid of all the data that's outside of it. Um, and another thing that's extremely useful, especially in mobile applications where you have a single receiver and you're just driving around, as you can say, I know the transmitter is not in this area. Don't compute any intersections here and throw all that data out. So I made a way to identify exclusion areas, um, where if you saw on uh, some of the earlier screenshots, I had like an orange circle. Uh, those orange circles were exclusion areas. Uh, if you don't have that, you end up with a lot of erroneous data um, when you're using a single receiver. Um, so here's kind of an application of using AOIs and exclusion areas. Um, so in the middle there, you see the big orange circle. You know for sure that the trans neither transmitter is there. So you, if you are able to eliminate all that data and focus on the two small blue areas, those are the areas of interest. So now you're able to pick out the conversation between two different transmitters. Um, so now looking towards the future, uh, we're going to add support for the Kraken SDR, which is uh, very recently shipped, um, at least in the US. I don't know where else in the world they're being shipped to at the moment. Um, that has the ability to generate multiple lobs within a certain bandwidth that it's looking at. Um, so I'm going to come up with a way to handle that. 
Um, it also has a new data format. So uh, I've seen that they, they're trying to do JSON, and they also currently do a CSV file. So I'll update DFA to work with those. Um, in the meantime, um, what I've had to do was uh, change the range of some of the adjustment sliders to work with the the data that's put out by the Kraken SDR software currently. Um, so the Kerberos SDR software, the, the power values and confidence values were a little bit different than what they are from the Kraken SDR software. Um, I also want to add a timeline uh, to the software so you can kind of scroll through and look at the data, how it re was received in the past. And I'm also open to other ideas and pull requests on GitHub. Uh, it's open software, uh, GPL license. So anyone is welcome to contribute. And uh, yep, that's all. Any questions? Sorry, there is just checking. Yeah. Um, could you please explain your receiver setup? What is required to make a station? There's another question as well. But could you please take this one? Sure. Um, so the Kerberos SDR, I, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but um, in the picture on the left side of the screen, you have four antennas uh, arranged into a square, so they're all equidistant from each other. And they each individually feed into this box down there at the bottom of the picture uh, that has a Kerberos SDR in it, which has four co coherent receivers. And the size of the array is based on the frequency you're interested in uh, receiving. So you can go, you can make it as far apart as a half a wavelength, um, or you can make them as close together as about a tenth of a wavelength. Um, the closer you get to the half wavelength, the more accurate the results are going to be. Um, ideally, you want to get this up as high as possible, so above the trees, above roof lines, stuff like that, to eliminate reflections. Um, so that, that would be a fixed station. In mobile applications, you would just put something on the roof of your car. Again, equidistant antennas, uh, spacing, same idea, based on the wavelength that you're trying to receive. And then you just feed that into your car. And again, it goes into the same radio. Uh, does that clear that up at all? Uh, yeah, I think that should clear it up. Also, there's another question. Uh, how do we use a custom map server with uh, DF aggregator? Uh, what do you mean, use a custom map software? A map server, uh, perhaps. Oh, so. Um, I haven't figured that out um, myself personally. I know I know it's a thing you can do um, for cesium. Um, I've never dived into it myself. I looked into it just enough to know that knowing how to set up and configure a map server is kind of its own uh, special skill set. Um, but I've never successfully done it myself. It's very involved, and map data takes up a lot of hard drive space. Okay. Uh, also, there's a final question. Can we use DF aggregator with GNU radio? I think that is the answer to this, but so. Um, so if you can find, if, if you can get it to GNU radio output the XML format um, with the lob data and location information, it'll work with that. Um, you can. It's also pretty easy to write custom uh, formats. It's just Python code, just add it to the class at the top of the script. OK, um, so you need to convert from the XML format that's provided by Kerberos or Kraken to something that would be read by Gino Radio. Yes. Um, so I'd, it would help to know what they're trying to think, what they're trying to do with the Gino Radio portion of it. Because if there are, um, yeah. there are GNU radio blocks for doing the direction finding portion, um, like getting the lo collecting the lobs. But DFA is there to just take the existing lobs. So DFA doesn't compute the lobs themselves. It computes um, intersection points based on lobs created by uh, radio hardware. 
Uh, yeah, I'm just asking him to clarify. Just a second. I don't know. See, in, with the workflow that I have, GNU Radio doesn't really fit into the equation. Uh, so those are all the questions I have so far. If uh, Mr. Deepak, uh, can you please post your clarification? So, okay, so he wants uh, direction finding from GNU Radio. So I guess it's not directly related to DF aggregator. Right, DF yes. aggregator yeah. takes, um, if, once you have the direction finding information, which is created by another piece of software, DF aggregator then computes the intersections for that and displays on a map. Um, there are GNU radio blocks that will work with radios like the USRP to come up with that information. And then from there, you'll just have to format it and feed it into DFA to compute intersections. Uh, yeah, sorry. Question. So, uh, uh, I hear Sorry, Aditya, we couldn't hear you. So, sorry, I was about to ask a question. That's it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, good. Uh, what I actually wanted to understand was, uh, is it, you know, uh, reformatable with uh, other sensors other than GPSG libraries? Like, for example, let's say you have a radio direction finder on your RC car and that has a separate set of mapping package. Can we reformat it for the same thing as well? Um. So you'll probably either have to edit DF aggregator itself to work with that data format, or you can build some sort of middleware script to change it from one format to another. Um, but in general, if you can find a way to feed DFA to lob information along with um, confidence and power values and location information, it should be able to work with it. Also, one more question. Those different sliders you have on your uh, web interface, what do each and every one of those sliders mean? Because the documentation sort of never specified what they mean. Um, sure. Actually, it might be better if I just uh, open up an instance of DFA and show you. Yeah, sure. Please do. No problem. All right, do you see DFA on my screen? Yes, we do, Cody. We do. All right, so this top slider is the minimum power. So, um, kind of the basically think of it like the squelch in a radio. Um, anything below this value gets thrown away. Okay. Um, next slider is your minimum confidence value. So, the Kerberos SDR and now the Kraken SDR. Um, they produce a confidence value to say, hey, how sure am I that the lob is in the correct direction? So anything that is below your minimum confidence value, gets, just like with the power value, gets thrown away. Um, and so it the uses confidence that. value from the Kerberos SGR or the Kraken SGR's interface should be as high as possible from my understanding, right? Right. You want them. You want those to be very high values. Okay. Uh, the power value is going to depend on your distance from the uh, transmitter and stuff like that. Got it. Um, are you trying to ask a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, those two, okay, the older version of the software, something I noticed was the rest of the two blocks were manual. In this version, I think it is upgraded and set to auto, right? Correct. Got it, Cody. And also, um, you know, this map is basically what you're using, the Bing map, right? This looks like a Bing map to me. Um, so there's a few different options. Um, Bing Maps is one of them. It requires a cesium ion token to use it, I think. Oh, no, it works. Um, if you try to load this one by default, it loads a blank screen, though. Um, there's also Esri World imagery, um, which I prefer. I think it looks a little bit cleaner. Uh, OpenStreetMaps is an option as well. 
but the CZMJS library will work with uh, all sorts of different data. All of this that's in here right now is uh, stuff that's built in. Also, uh, this thing can be done offline as well, right? From my understanding. Uh, yes. Or we need so, to change the TPL files somewhere. There is a way to load um, just like straight image files. Um, and then if you know how to run your own map server, uh, but like I said earlier, that's kind of a skill all by itself. Um, you can point Cesium to that custom map server uh, that will require modifying some of the code. Got it, Cody. Thank you. That's yep. all right. And then I'm just going to finish going through these sliders really quick. So the Epsilon slider, um, basically that's the maximum distance between those intersection points uh, when you're deciding what what makes up a cluster. And your minimum points per sample. So when it's going through and computing those clusters, it basically draws a circle within a spot, uh, the size of the epsilon value, and says, OK, is there enough points within this little circle to, to justify saying this is part of the cluster? Um, and then you can, you can turn clustering off if you want to. And then you'll see all sorts of data. Turn that back on. And you'll see it throws most of it out. And then if you don't like what the auto values are doing, you can come in and change those. Okay, that's really uh, I cool have option. a question mm -hmm. regarding the clustering algorithm. Uh, is there any specific reason you chose dbscan? As it looks like you could just draw a Warnai uh, or like a convex hull around these points, right, and get the uh, synthroid. So, or, of the different algorithms that I tried, so I tried k-means, and I, another one was called z or xi or something like that. Um, they didn't produce quite the results that I was looking for. I found that DB scan had the one the easiest to tune parameters and two produce the um, the most correct uh, clusters. I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, I only asked because if the number of points or number of uh, dimensions increase, it's extremely disadvantageous. Right, so the DB scan becomes one memory intensive and. Also, I think the results are not as good. Oh, you're breaking up there. Oh, sorry. I meant uh, so DB scan with uh, high dimensional data. I mean, this is not high dimensional in the traditional sense, but the number of points increases. It's going to become very memory intensive, right? So if you have a lot of pairings. Yeah, so that, that is a problem I ran into, and that's why I had to limit the the data set it would look at to about 20,000 points, um, which for, for the majority of the what you'll be doing, like a day's worth of um, collecting data from fixed sites, um, or even just like an hour's worth of driving around, will kind of stay within that limit. And even then, when you're picking those 20,000 points, it picks the 20,000 best points, so that the ones with the highest confidence values, stuff like that. OK. Um, but yeah, I have I have crashed the software before going, computing more than that. Um, I think my laptop can go up to about 100,000 points before it kills uh, the 32 gigs of RAM. Yeah. Uh, so is there, uh, is there any option to add your uh, other clustering algorithms, perhaps? Uh, I'm sure it could be done pretty easily. Um, it's per the, the code is pretty well commented. Now let me pull up GitHub here. Um, so it uses the uh, pandas, or I'm sorry, sklearn um, library, yeah. which has many, many clustering algorithms available in it. And um, you can add it to the import statement up here. And then down the way here, I have, uh, so I just have a little um, function. Sorry, I couldn't think of the word. I'll do db scan. And that actually runs it when it's in its own um, thread. 
and I'm sure you could just add other functions to that. And then when you're doing the process data, which is kind of like the main loop for computing that stuff, instead of calling out um, DB scan, you can call out another one. Okay. okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll take a look at this. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much, buddy. Yeah, no problem. So uh, where could people find you if they want to uh, take this up further or maybe talk to you about direction finding or anything else? Sure. So there's the um, RF Hackers uh, Discord, which if you go to, let me find the right side here. Uh, if you go to rfhackers.com and you join Discord there, uh, my name is Corey in the channel. Um, there's an SDR channel and there's an off-topic channel, so you could reach out for help in either one of those. Um, you could, on GitHub, you can come and either open an issue if it's something related to that, or you can come into discussions and open a thread there. Awesome. So thank you very much for this excellent presentation and answering all our questions, Corey. Uh, yeah, OK. Next slide, Bala. OK, our next presenter is a member of the organizing committee. Uh, and he's going to be talking about wireless channels. So Aditya was part of uh, Brisk InfoSec, and he's currently an R&D and DSP engineer. So he his primary interests were are signal reversing, electronics warfare, side channel applications, and SDR in general. So I'm going to hand it over to him, and he's going to be talking about wireless channels. Thank you. All right. Not able, right? Good. Share my screen now. All right. All right. Is my screen visible? My screen is visible, right? I can go through? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can start. All right. Good evening. I know it's a touch bit late, but you know, further ado, let's get into the presentation. So, what I'm majorly going to be talking about is wireless channels 101 dash one. This would be the most, you know, basic introduction to what a wireless channel is. How does one know and classify and understand a wireless channel? And how does one proceed about uh, modeling a channel? And most of all, why channel modeling is quite important when it comes down to wireless communications? Because uh, take take any communication, uh, any wireless communication, for example, based upon your channel model, you're going to de decide how, what kind of modulation you're going to pick and choose, what kind of receiver you're going to pick and choose, direction and estimation algorithms. So down the line, the wireless channel modeling plays a huge role in each and every design aspect of communication system. That's why modeling of a wireless channel and understanding the... Now, let's get to the next one. Before we get into the classifications and everything about a wireless channel, let's let's just you know understand what is going to be the objective and scope. By the way, this is going to be a continuously running presentation. This is only 101-1. So by the time this this uh, this uh, session of the presentation completes, the listener will have a basic idea on what a wireless channel is, the different types of wireless channel, approach and philosophy behind modeling a wireless channel, and a very wider perspective on radio propagation channel modeling. And how these values play an important role in designing the so designing some aspects of a communication system. So let's get to the next part. Now, before we you know we get into the all fancy stuff like free space path loss, log distance, GB, all those things, let's first understand what a radio propagation is. Consider this slide, but you know, let's go to whiteboard for a moment here. My board is visible, right? Yes. All right, let's uh, begin then. So I have a, a TX and I have a RX. Now, these two guys want to talk to each other, be it bidirectional or unidirectional or whatever. Now, the primary mode of communication is they're going to talk to the talk via R. 
or whatever we call it, Aether. Um, in you know, in uh, 3GPP specification, they call it the AI R interface or wireless channel or free space or whatever. Now, what happens is this guy will be having an antenna who is going to transmit wireless signals that is going to propagate in all these places and cross this guy. And this guy is probably going to receive this. Probably going to receive this. Now, that's where a key terminology lies. Now, let's consider the most basic thing. The distance between these two guys is G or some literatures refer them as R. Now, what happens when the signal travels from point A to point B? It can go through multiple effects. For example, it can go through attenuation, path loss, and all these things. Now, before that, let's consider. For it to transmit, uh, it needs to have a specific frequency, uh, as we call it a carrier frequency or anything. So let's consider a traditional wireless uh, communication system where the frequency of transmitting F is equal to around like uh, 1.5 gigahertz. Now, what we need to know is basically lambda. So lambda for this would be, as we know, C over F. Sorry, my F is bad. Um, this would be C over F, which would be like 0.2 meters. Cool, no problem. But now the next question starts for us. How are we going to know what are the wireless aspects or what 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 are the major things that is going to cover this channel? Like for example, let's say I, I'm 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 receiving the signal. Uh, what is going to be the phase mismatch? Like I know it's it's we are, we are going a bit ahead. I know, but what is going to be the phase mismatch? Is the signal going to fade? How much of fade is going to be there? Loss then uh, what kind of uh, attenuation is going to be present in the signal? What is going to be the scatterers in the atmosphere? So because the signal is not going to be traveling through free space. If you consider a domestic environment and a, or an urban environment, as we call it, they're going to have buildings. They're going to have uh, water bodies, which I'll mark in blue. They're going to be having water bodies. Then they're going to be having moving elements. They're, then they're going to have high-rise buildings. This is further going to hinder your transmission. And most of all, for example, this receiver could be moving. The receiver could be mobile. Now, all these things are going to pose a problem when it comes down to what a channel is. Now, let's first take one problem at a time. The first problem that we are going to ask ourselves is how we are going to solve this wireless channel. Traditionally, this thing is going to be an electromagnetic wave. By solving field equations or Maxwell's equations as we call it, we can actually see what the wireless channel is. But, but, but now we have to consider this. If we start solving field equations, you see the wavelength for this guy is around 0.2 meters at, uh, at, at our uh, example of transmitting frequency of 1.5 gigahertz, meaning we have to know the location of this obstacle x comma y if you consider for for now two dimensional on a submeter distance submeter accuracy now here is where things get very very tedious now if the mobile if the receiver is also mobile we really won't be able to do anything at this point so now comes the reason why we have to model a wireless channel. Now, this, this is what an entry level reader needs to understand why we need to go about channel design. Now, let's get back to our slides for a minute. There. All right. Now, I was just discussing all these aspects. Now, you see, most of these measurements that we take uh from these places from from the receiving ele received electromagnetic wave they are going to be empirical in nature at this point we're going to have a receiver and we are going to see what's the power in the receiver it's very experimental in nature we can't keep on going out of the laboratory to, to conduct these experiments we need to have a solid statistical model or a probabilistic model that is going to combine all these different aspects of a signal but an empirical model also helps a lot. For example, there is a model called as Winger 2 channel model, which is used by 
3GPP, which is actually quite empirical and statistical in nature and has proved well and, in a, and, and tested, and, uh, tested by time and field. Now, all these measurements that we make are basically a function of what time you're making that measurement, at what frequency you're making that measurement and the location. If you're in an urban area, you cannot expect your measurements to be as good as your uh, line of sight communication. So that is something we have to consider again. And also, if you're far away from the transmitter, the power measurement process is not tedious, but it will be too low. If you go too closer to the receiver, you won't be able to um, understand why the power might switch to infinity suddenly or uh, go high suddenly. Now, here is where our understanding of radio zones come in. Now, you see, whenever, let's, let's go back to our uh, board again. Now, I'll draw the same uh, diagram down here. Again, we have a TX and uh, we have a RX. Now, this TX and RX need to talk to each other. Now, we have radio zone as we call it. Now, whenever this TX transmits, let us say at a power of some X watts, this is not going to be the same X watts. Now, how this power of X watts and how do we decide what are the different zones are available is something we have to understand. Now, if 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 let's say I'm standing somewhere here, I'm measuring at this point, my power level will be different. Now, if I move closer to the receiver, my power level should go high. Now, if I move far away from the receiver, my power level should go low as logic states. Now, when I'm too close to the transmitter, let us say a distance that is actually lesser than two times uh, lambda square. I don't exactly remember the formula. I think two times lambda square over R. We can get back to the slides. My power level will be quite uh, high. Now, this is called as the near field region. As we are very close to the receiver and the and and and, and, and within sorry, uh, I'll correct this over. It's lambda square over R. So lambda square over two. If you are at a distance of lambda square over 2, then I don't think it's lambda square. Yeah, it's lambda over 2, my bad. So if uh, we are close to the receiver at a distance of lambda over 2, we can actually say we are in a real reactive near field, which is actually very close to the receiver. Now, as you move away, let us say to a distance where your range R is actually greater than your uh, two times your whatever the distance d is over two or, or la sorry lambda then this is called as a far field region so if you consider radiation we can, we only consider the far field zone now this near field zone or uh, is called as the fresnel zone and this zone is called as the fraunhofer zone now we have to understand these two aspects if you have to know from where we are taking the measurements. Most of the radiated measurements will be taken at Fraunhofer zone, which is basically the radio radi radiation zone. Now let us consider the next part. Let me go back to my slides. I'll try to run through them as fast as possible. Now, if we go to the next part, then let us go touch bit into detail. Let us look at some graphs. Now, when at, now you see, I've plotted two graphs over here. Now, these two graphs are a function of frequency and uh, range with respect to the laws in decibels. As you can see, the frequency increases, uh, the wavelength decreases, lambda is equal to C over F. Now, this causes more attenuation as well. Now, how does attenuation affect? Let us consider millimeter wave bands. Millimeter wave bands are very prevalent and uh, are very touchy in nature. You, you simply, you know, even if there is a little bit of rain, you cannot, you will not be having complete millimeter wave coverage. It's, it's simply because of its transmitting frequency that we can consider. So, and sometimes, you know, they use millimeter wave frequencies to understand gas attenuation as well and presence of gaseous molecules and uh, air as well. So, let, let's, let's roll on. Now, the next part is why understanding radiation, uh, radio propagation is important for measurement. Now, radio propagation is what gives you the key physical parameters that we are going to take into a model. Now, when we start doing the model, how we are going to use these physical parameters is the real question. 
Now, if you ask these two questions, the next obvious question one person will should ask himself is the defining trait of a wireless channel. You see, the signal variation is a function of time, frequency, and location. But not only time, frequency, and location, there are a bunch of other things that are superposed on these things as well. For example, obstacles, then you have uh, other uh, a foliage attenuation, then you have uh, gaseous attenuation in the case of uh, millimeter waves. Let's roll on. Now, the most basic classification when you see in a wireless model is basically the two types of model. One is called as the large scale model, another one is the small scale model. Large scale model are, uh, are, are basically cover a lot of large scale phenomena, like for example, free space path loss. This is, this is a very large scale phenomena. They actually accommodate a lot of LOS uh, things, line of sight things as well for radio communication. The most famous models that we use for macro cell or basically cell side design, as we call it, where we take large scale model consideration or cellular. Uh, uh, for cellular communications, we consider Okumura Hata, Stanford University Interim, it's not used much. But when you actually go to a uh, privately or a locally established base station, then you have to go for a different microcell model. Now, these effects of large scale model will be added up to the effects of small scale model where there is multipath scattering, reflection, uh, reflection, diffraction, and deep fades. And it will actually give you the final channel effect that is present in a wireless communication system. Now, now comes the actual modeling philosophy. You see, when you talk about a wireless communication system, there are a few things that actually affect your uh, affect your parameters a lot. Down the line, when we go uh, over this path, we'll see what each and every one of these things does to our system. Our Doppler spec, based upon the Doppler, based upon the frequency, this is going to vary a lot. It's basically a function of your uh, frequency with respect to speed. Then comes multipath spread. Then coherence time and coherence bandwidth. We, uh, let's consider frequency and time now. And finally, delay spread. You see, Doppler is completely related to mobility of the system. Multipath is completely related to location. Coherence is completely related to time. When all these parameters, as we saw earlier, which are our key physical parameters that is going to help in our modeling philosophy is the one that we have actually considering here and giving them names. Now, how if if you're moving at quite high frequency, let's let's see a demo probably in a for a Doppler environment, you'll see how the simple even a baseband modulation scheme changes. Let's consider that down the line. Now, you see, when you take all these parameters, your channel is going to start behaving like a filter. Now, whatever a filter is, we need taps. Now here is where you start modeling the filter taps. For modeling these filter taps, you're going to need probability. There are two approaches we consider in modeling. One is deterministic. This works with large scale model. Now, where do you use a large scale model? Let's say you have to place a base station in a random location or in a previously known location, let's say your uh, urban area, you're going to do a very deterministic channel model for, based on whatever the empirical data you are having. Now, winner 2, ITU, and 3GPP models are very well known for their empirical characteristic. The next one is stochastic model. Now, here is where some, some key aspects of a communication system come in. So, we saw the taps previously, right? This HL of M. We are going to know, we have to decide how much of these taps we need and what do each and every one of these taps do and how much these taps are going to vary so that we are going to model our channel in that specific way. You see, the most famous uh, channel model that we are going to consider for this uh, phase of hands-on demo, at least it's our very simple, simplistic Gaussian, uh, additive white Gaussian noise as of now. And down the line, we'll uh, probably we'll see a demo on, uh, if time permits, we'll see a demo on how a relay uh, model actually affects. You see, uh, it, it's based on the sum of sinusoids that is present in the system. Now, before we actually go to a hands-on, let's just look at one statistical model. The Rayleigh fading model. Now, we can say this is one of the most tested and trained and uh, well decided probability models because whatever the measurements that were conducted uh, actually fell close to a Rayleigh uh, fading model. Now, this model we need to assume it, if you consider central limit theorem and probability, if there is a lot of scatterers, then your uh, variables are going to be Gaussian in nature. So, we're not assuming a lot of scatterers. So the channel response will not be Gaussian, 
but the channel response for the very limited amount of scatterers is going to behave like a Rayleigh distribution function. Now you see the value of this Rayleigh distribution function is going to be evenly distributed from 0 to 2 pi and the two random variables that is going to come into this place as for real and imaginary parts of your system are going to be IIR, a Gaussian uncorrelated noise. This is very applicable in an urban scattering system. So now let us see these two figures. Now you see the first figure, there is actually a Doppler. In the second figure, there is actually zero Doppler. When you see Doppler, the time domain of the wave changes a lot. This is a BPSK transmitting, uh, this is a BPSK scheme. You can actually see the time domain of the wave actually changing a lot based upon uh, Doppler frequency that you are getting. Now let's get to the next part. A couple of hands-on demo and we can wrap up uh, as of now. Let me open my GRC. All right, uh, let's go to the complex model. So if you actually see this model, it's quite simple and straightforward. We have a signal source and we have a noise source that is Gaussian in nature. What we are trying to simulate is a very simple additive white Gaussian noise here. So I start running the simulation. Now you can actually see we are receiving some signal at some point. Now this is the signal amplitude. Let me actually start increasing the signal amplitude a bit. What we need is actually a circle. Now, if noise is actually, okay, let's get the noise to zero. This is the ideal thing that we actually need. Now, when noise is actually added to the system, let me actually remove the received signals. Now you can see the transmitted signals, which is actually noise corrupted. Now I start increasing the noise as much as possible. You're going to see my signal and the constellation is going to vary. For people who want to know how this is actually a circle, then uh, we can refer to uh, what is I and what is what is in phase and what is quadrature and why using a circle is actually you know very easy in terms of understanding constellation points as well. Now this is one of the hands-on demo that I wanted to show on how uh, additive white Gaussian noise is going to corrupt uh, your uh, wireless channel. But let's go to the other thing as well, very, very, very basic digital communication system. Now, what I have here uh, is a basic channel model. And also, we are going to consider only additive white Gaussian noise here. I think I might have the, all right, no issues. Let's get to that later, no problem. All right. Now, uh, this is also additive white Gaussian noise, and this is, it's a very simple BPSK modulation. Let me actually start this sum. All right. Um, okay, for all these things. You see, uh, this is my channel received the signal. No, sorry, this is my channel received the signal that you see here. And this is actually the received signal after polyphase clock synchronization. Now, if I start increasing the noise, I should be getting points around uh, this place and points around this place. Now, if you have a system like this, which is most prevalent if you see any digital wireline communication, all that you need to do here is do a hard decision decoding. Just draw a line through one and see where your uh, receiving points fall. And you can simply decide whether data is a zero or a one. Let me try to find a Gaussian model. I think it will be available easily. Yeah. Sorry, Rayleigh. So this Rayleigh, if you see again, I have the same BPSK modulator, but here I have a very simple Rayleigh model and I have uh, two more blocks called as sinu, which is the total number of sinusoids because it's an addition of the sinusoid that is in the Rayleigh model. We'll see how it is down the line and Doppler frequency. Let you know. Let, let us first you know play around with the Doppler frequency. Don't see how things are going to vary for us. I'll increase the Doppler frequency alone as of now. As you can see, uh, the waves are, you know, compressed and rarefied. Uh, uh, in, in, you know, gender, gender, uh, stationary wave terms, we can call this compression and rarefaction. You can see this a lot in mechanical waves. Now, this actually means the target is moving closer to the receiver and away from the receiver. Now, this is how Doppler frequency plays a role. Now, if you actually start increasing the number of sinusoids as well, you won't see much effects, but your constellation point is pretty much un. un, un uh, un, un, undecipherable as of now. We can't do hard decision decoding here. Now, this is why 
one has to understand why channel modeling is important and how we can build successful receiver around the same channel model. I think uh, I'll uh, wrap off my presentation here and we can continue further in part uh, two. Any questions as of now? I'm checking one sec. Uh, so far, Aditya, there has been no question asked. Uh, okay. Can you just uh, let the audience know how they can contact you or me? All right. Uh, or you can contact me in SASG Slack channel as always. Or uh, you can get my email ID from the organizing committee. This uh, They can provide you by email ID. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the presentation, Aditya. Uh, it was very enlightening. Also, this is the end of the event four, and this marks one year of our organization. And we are very glad all of you have joined. Please do join us for event five, which would be held on November 5th, tentatively. Uh, also, we have our own. Uh, we have various uh, means by which you can contact us. You can join our Slack workspace. You can please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can contact us on Twitter at uh, Akashwani2021. Uh, also, we have our uh, we have a Gmail where you can uh, you know message us, message the organizing committee if you want to give a talk, if you want to just join the Slack channel. And we have we now have a WhatsApp group specific for uh, software defined radio in India. So you can just uh, send me a, send us your phone number. We can add you to the group as well. And please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thank you very much for all our speakers. Thank you very much for attending our event. Uh, for the closing ceremonies, I'm going to hand over to Neil Pandeya, who has some announcements to make as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rohan. I just had one announcement for uh, the community. I wanted to remind people that the GNU Radio Conference will be coming at the end of September, on September 26th uh, through September 30th. It runs for the, for the full week. Um, the first day is sort of a new user's day. And there's lots of uh, tutorials and, and getting started help and resources. Um, the Friday is kind of a hack fest type of day uh, and, and the opportunity for working with uh, the GNU Radio developers and working on code and collaborating on projects. And the middle three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, are uh, filled with technical paper presentations. Um, and so if, if you can make it to Washington, DC, it would be, I think, a great resource, a great opportunity to see all the technical content and also to meet with a lot of people, collaborate, uh, make new connections, and uh, and get new ideas and, and things like that. Um, certainly, traveling can be difficult, and, and, and depending on where in the world you are, it might be hard or expensive to reach Washington. The event will be live streamed. It won't sort of have a virtual conference uh, component to it in terms of interacting with other people and things like that. But the paper presentations will be live streamed and they will be recorded. You can find the recordings for past GNU Radio events, uh, conferences on the YouTube channel. Um, there, are, there are playlists for each of the previous years of the GNU Radio conference, I think going back to 2015. And so you can see the, the, the previous uh, presentations and content there. Um, so if, uh, if you can't make it to the event, then you can participate through the live stream, and you can also join the GNU Radio uh, Matrix chat server, where there will be multiple channels dedicated to the GNU Radio conference, and those channels are quite active. And so you can also virtually participate that way, again, through the through the live stream and through the uh, GNU Radio Matrix channel uh, uh, chat server. Um, a lot of people are active on the chat server, and you can certainly ask questions and have discussions, you know, technical discussions or otherwise on the chat server. So I hope in some shape or form, everybody can make the conference and participate uh, in some way. Uh, I think it's a great resource. 
uh, for technical content and, and networking and uh, opportunities and connecting with people. Um, if you have any questions about the conference, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to answer any questions or direct you to the right person. Um, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, beyond the two that you see there on the slide, our WhatsApp group and uh, uh, email group as well, um, and the uh, Guinea Radio Conference itself. Um, as my colleague, Mr. Rohan, uh, just mentioned, our next event, number five, will be uh, held on November 5, um, Saturday, November 5. Uh, that that date is uh, tentative, but 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 should stick. Um, you can check our website for updates, um, and we'll we'll confirm the date shortly. Uh, thanks everybody for joining um, on the uh, on the live stream or um, or uh, or otherwise. Um, this this event was recorded as as all of our events are recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, we'd like to give a special thanks to our speakers. Um, the event would not be possible without them, and uh, we had uh, some really good presentations that really um, helped make the event worthwhile and valuable. So, um, thanks to our to our speakers for taking the time. And with that, I'll I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Rohan, for any very last uh, remarks. Thank you, Mr. Neil. So that brings us to the end of event four. Uh, those who are interested in pursuing software defined radio or GNU radio, please do attend the GNU radio conference if you can. Otherwise, please do watch the live streams. It would be really helpful. Uh, just as a, an aside, all of us met in a virtual GNU radio conference where we conceived of this group. So there are plenty of networking opportunities, even online. That uh, you could meet other enthusiasts and maybe collaborate with them on projects. So uh, thanks, everybody, for, yeah, sorry, Mr. Neil, say something? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining this event. This marks one year of uh, events that we have conducted. This marks one, uh, this is our first birthday, effectively. So. Uh, our birthday celebration had many wonderful speakers. Thank you to all of them. Thank you for to Dr. Sylvain for the demos and Corey, and also for members of our organizing committee for our organi for making such wonderful presentations and talks. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you, Mr. Neil. Uh, and thank you, everyone. See you all next time. Bye.